Hey everybody, this is Morgan from Seven Dust, and you're listening to Discography Discussion. You're listening to Discography Discussion, episode 137, Seven Dust. Featuring Morgan Rose of Seven Dust and Scott Bowling of Good Company. Hey guys, it's Scott Bowling from Good Company. Hosted by Dan Terry. The I, I think what Joe's getting at, he's just fanboying out a little too much to, to articulate it. But, uh, <laughs> and Joseph Wren. I'm talking to Morgan Rose! Presented by DiscussMetal.com And if you need something to feel real again before you go numb, then you are ready for this episode of Discography Discussion. I am Joe, that is Dan, Scott Bowling is here, and we're talking to Morgan Rose because Scott is our friend. Scott made the call, said, you guys want to talk to Morgan? And before he could say the last name, I said, I'm in, dude. <laughs> well, actually, actually, what happened is I, uh, I, I sent him a message and I was like, yeah, yeah, we should do an episode again like we did with, like, The Bride. And then it was actually Scott that was like, well, hey, you know, I could probably get Morgan Rose to come do something with us, too. And I was like, oh, yeah, I mean, I'm not going to say no to that. He so, would die if he had. Uh, we we have a, a, a we have a, a bananas uh, interview with Morgan Rose for you guys to listen to tonight. Uh, dude, it just, I mean, there just no no boundaries. We, we asked so many questions and he had so many answers uh in one of our longer episodes you know people have been complaining lately joe that our episodes are too short they want long episodes again well here, here you go <laughs> it's like if you if you took forrest gump and you watch forrest gump all the way through and then you restart it and watch it all over again that's about how long the podcast seemed to go pretty much but now it, who has a better story though forrest gump or morgan rose <laughs> <laughs> that's a tie they're both great. Yeah, no, yeah. One's a real person. One's not. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! But uh, yeah, so we, we we talked to Morgan Rose for a long time. We 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 found an appreciation for Lion's Choice, and it was just the best time. Every now and again, you know, we'll get somebody on to that wants to talk about their own discography with us. And I thought this was kind of a cool. This is almost like the our version of VH1's Behind the Music. <laughs> Where we, we got the actual story behind a lot of this stuff. So for you diehard fans out there, if there's ever something you've wanted to know about Seven Dust, hopefully we asked the question and got the answer. I actually think Scott might be the only person in the room who's a bigger Seven Dust fan than me. That's awesome, man. What's your favorite album? What's your favorite Seven Dust album? I don't even think we talked about that. It's definitely Seasons, because that's the first album I heard. Every song oh, is a song. single. Oh, we become best friends, brother. <laughs> yes. I totally agree. Butch Walker. Uh, have you watched the making of when they, uh, if you bought the season's album? They, Absolutely. Yeah. Back in yeah. the day when the CD started to come with DVDs and it had to be a behind the scenes hour long documentary. I worship that stuff, man. <laughs> I think that was gold for me. Dude, yeah. that's amazing. Mine's the animosity, but seasons is a close second. Well, I think animosity is their most popular album overall and there's a good reason for it yeah that one's my favorite as well as animosity yeah it's a huge jump man if you listen to like home all the way through and they played home uh live when they go from home to animosity it's like what happened i mean it's just complete the songs are so better you know so I, yeah. better <laughs> so better so they better are. no I, I largely agree it, it's that record was was their heaviest and yeah, they they just kind of finally figured out their sound, and uh, and that that that's what kind of carried them through into greatness. After that, yeah, and, and the the pod I didn't mean to interrupt you, but the the podcast we love like uh, Roach Coach. I wish they would do Animosity because I know they did Home, which was really cool. And uh, man, I wish they'd have Animosity on their you know cover that uh, Roach Coach podcast. I'm sure they'll get, I'm sure they'll get around to it. They did um, Home recently, right? Right, right pretty recently yeah they so like i think i think what they do and i could be totally wrong about this and and he can correct me later but uh i think it's like one album for a bigger band a year 
you know like, oh. they, they, like they'll do a corn review like a, a new, another corn album every like once a year or so so they got time to talk about some of the other stuff so they've already had, had done seven dust twice so i think uh, it probably won't be too long before they do uh, animosity well, that'll be cool man absolutely well, before God bites his tongue, I want to take this time to say thank you to everyone for listening to the podcast. Thank you for listening and for subscribing. If you are not a subscriber, then you can find everything Discography Discussion at DiscussMetal.com. We are on Spotify, Apple and Google Podcasts, TuneIn Radio, Stitcher. So if you have an Amazon Echo or a Google Home, you have no excuse. Ask it to play the latest episode of the Discography Discussion podcast, and it will. We're also on Facebook and on Twitter at Discuss Metal. Be sure to like, favorite, and subscribe. It really helps us out. It lets us know you're listening, and now Dan is going to tell us all about five-star reviews. We love five-star reviews here on Discography Discussion, and the reason we love them is because they make me feel good. You know what makes me feel good? The two I'm about to read right now. We got one from The Scarab God. Lots to say about this podcast. Been meaning to write a review for a few weeks now. Sorry for the delay. These dudes have such a killer show. I rarely listen to shows with multiple hosts because I think the personalities almost always clash and it gets annoying. These guys have the best chemistry I've come across. Even whenever they clearly disagree, it's so darn entertaining. And that's the thing. I don't even agree with everything that they have to say, but that's part of the fun. It really is like hanging out at a bar with a few friends, pounding bud heavies and talking about records, except you were just a listener for now. I'm hell bent on being a guest on the show. So anyway, great guys, great music, great guests on the show, and a great variety. They have episodes covering the big names, Metallica, Rammstein, Zeo, to some deep-cut Christian market bands. Was stoked to see an episode covering Bride and Mortification on the list. Very happy to have found this podcast. Excited to see where it goes. Ooh, I don't even know what to say. That's a, that's a book. <laughs> Thank you, Scott Bowling, for making us talk about Bride. He did. Yeah, that's so awesome. He came over to my, he came over to my house and put a knife to my throat and was like, "You're gonna talk about bride." And I'm like, "I don't want to talk about bride." And he's like, "We're not here to talk about what you want." It was yeah, insane. Exactly. <laughs> it happened just like that. Yeah. He drove all the way to St. Louis. It was incredible. Me, me and uh, me and Dale, uh, the singer of bride, we were together. He drove the car. Yeah, he would. <laughs> he came all the he came all the way over from like what New Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I would be on your show, but I'm, I live in New Zealand. You're like, oh, well, I guess you're never going to be on my show then. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so the other, the next one I have is uh, by Keith Apparatus. It's called I Hate Titles. Solid podcast. Keep doing what you're doing. Among everything else, I much enjoy the YouTube guests you have on, like Metal Jesus and Cinemassacre. If you could add one element to your format, it would be to include trivia tidbits once in a while. A few examples, Adam D. from Killswitch Engage was the drummer on their first two albums before moving to guitar. Adam D. of Killswitch also produced Norma Jean's Bless the Martyr, Kiss the Child, Nine Inch Nails recording Broken and DWS in Shannon Tate House, and any of the Dillinger Escape Plan drummers. I think we can try to dig up some trivia whenever we're talking about these bands. If anybody knows random trivia that people will need to research for hours on the internet and dive into the rabbit hole of message boards, it's Dan Terry. I do that anyway. I just didn't think anybody cared. <laughs> so <laughs> I left a lot of it out. That's that's a, that's a mistake on my part. But uh, one of the things, guys, you know, five-star reviews are great. They make me feel good. I love reading them on the show. But there's one thing that you can do that really helps us out, and that is to share the episodes. Whenever this podcast posts every week, share it with your friends. If they're into metal, they're going to enjoy the podcast just like you do. Sharing is caring, and that is super generic, and I don't care. I also want to take a minute to shout out our loyal patrons. These are the guys that give us money every month. I mean, come on. I got to shout them out. They're paying for it. That includes Alexander, Brian Dean, David Brown, Jeffrey De Los Santos. The actual Mac. Kiki Kuti, do you love me? I do love you. Lance Allagood. The king of metal. The king of metal. <laughs> Native Keebs. Patrick Asplund. Samuel Woodward. And Zach Barr. You guys are the music makers. You're the reason why this show still exists. Because I can't pay for this on my own. And now Scott Bowling is going to tell us all about good company. Good Company is a show that I started. Uh, originally, I was going to do a podcast, but I did a, a show in my basement 
And so I actually interview rock musicians. If you think like VH1 behind the music, when, when that was awesome and you had to wait every week to get one of those episodes. Well, with my show, you had to wait a lot longer, but <laughs> <laughs> you get you get the same kind of storyline, like kind of like the show, discography discussion. Discussion, you get kind of uh, the history, and I have a bunch of props and vinyls, and we kind of show them on cameras. By the way, the show has cameras. We have three cameras, um, so we film the show in my basement. Anyway, getting distracted. So I have these props and vinyls, and I say props because everybody goes. I've never seen that vinyl before because it's a prop. It's not actually a vinyl. And we go through <laughs> each record, and, uh, and it's been awesome. I've done it for past probably like three years now. Um, so we're coming up on our, like our 50th episode, and I haven't told anybody this, but I got Ray Lazier from Corn coming here on Saturday. So Sweet. To it. Well, that's exciting. So I need to show up at your house randomly on Saturday. Got it. You should. <laughs> We I'll write knew that he'd down. get us eventually. You should tell John, but John will probably diss me because he'll say, uh, I'm, I'm going to be there, but Falcons, you know, can't make it. I know John's <laughs> been hitting the John's been hitting the gym a lot lately, and uh, it's like killing him. I, the other night I was like, let's do some episodes. And he's like, dude, I'm, I'm dead from the gym, so we're going to have to do these later. <laughs> I was like, all right. When I hear stuff like that, I just stare at my own belly and I go, ah, I hate myself. Yeah. <laughs> I need to get back into the gym. I don't. I don't know, man. I, you know, I had to work my whole life to get to this size. I don't want to ruin it by going to the gym. <laughs> it's called. Den- it's called denial. It's a Seven Dust song. You should check it out. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, guys, without further ado, I think. Uh, I think we we've spent enough time beating around the bush. Let's get into this Seven Dust interview, and we'll uh, we'll be back to talk to you guys afterwards. It's good to hear from you. What's going on? Yeah, you too, buddy. And we can hang out for him today. I know it, man. You're close enough. I'm doing nothing. Today is a day of leisure. After I get done with this, I'll move a PlayStation 4 from one room to another, and that'll be like my workout for the day. There you go. Borderlands 3, right? Yeah. I'm glad we're on the same page. Joe's been obsessed with <laughs> yeah. Borderlands. I have two jobs, edit the podcast, work for a living, and play Borderlands 3. I know what I said. <laughs> there you go. Well, <laughs> yep. My little dude, is he's got a different system in every room of the house. It's ridiculous. There's like, there's a PS3 in my room. There's a PS4 upstairs. There's an Xbox One in the living room. There's an Xbox something else somewhere. I mean, they're everywhere. <laughs> man, my son would love it. That would be like heaven. He's only six. But oh, yeah, man. <laughs> he would drive him crazy. <laughs> <He would> love it. <laughs> right? My dude's 11, and it's like, it's, it's crazy. I love all this retro yeah. stuff they're bringing back, man. Like, my son, I'm raising him like he was born in the 90s. Like, he's playing Super Mario Brothers and yeah. Punch Out, and he thinks that's, like, the best thing ever. I <laughs> uh, love it. That's great. Yeah, your place is a little, your place is great for all that stuff, Scott. You got all the games over there. Uh, yeah, thank you, brother. Yeah, looks like a arcade. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Love I'm jealous, it. Scott. Oh, I told you already, but I'm going to have to change my lights just to match the purple and blue glory that is Scott Bowling's basement. <laughs> yeah. It looks like a strip club uh, with all the lights. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love it. Got a little halftime action in, in the Clemson, North Carolina game all tied up. Mm. Sounds like North Carolina's going to take it. That would be so great. That'd be amazing. That is my birthplace, North Carolina. Oh yeah, we're part of Carolina. Well, it was just uh, it was in Cape Fear, but it's kind of a dumb story because like I was literally just my wife or my wife, my mom was from St. Louis, <laughs> and uh, she was just up there visiting her sister while she was pregnant, and they I just happened to be born there. I wasn't from there. Oh wow! Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, but I do I do like the uh, the. Cape Fear, so you know where are you born? Cape Fear yeah. Hospital, you know. <laughs> yeah. So you're a big Cardinals and Blues and all that. Are you all St. Louis crazy like that? Um, I mean, I like, I like, obviously, we all like the Blues now. Um, but <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, uh, Cardinals, yeah, we're the worst fans in baseball. It's so funny. My ex girl is, is uh, from St. Louis, and uh, it's like fucking insanity there with the with the cardinals and the blues 
They never really gave a shit about the Rams, I guess. So the Rams said, okay, I guess we'll leave. Yeah, fuck the Rams. We tried to give a shit about them, but, you know, when you win a Super Bowl and then the next year you go back to the Super Bowl and then lose and never go back to the playoffs, it's hard to buy yeah. into it. But then again, St. Louis has always been baseball and hockey. Yeah. Even though the Blues yeah. are basically Canadian at this point. Yeah, well, pretty much all of them are. That's why we won. <laughs> right. Right. We can't hold a hockey team in Georgia. It's pathetic. I know, right? I've never even been to a hockey game, which is sad. Really? Oh, man. Yeah. You never I just seen two it. dudes just start fighting for no reason? It's like the best part. Yeah, I've <laughs> never experienced it. I want to like, you want to go? Uh, <laughs> okay. You want to do it? All right, let's do it right here. Okay, cool. <laughs> how's your brother? I mean, that's basically how it is. <laughs> they ask, would you like to do this now? You know? <laughs> yeah, that's wild, dude. If I hadn't seen it on YouTube, I wouldn't believe it. Yeah. Like, what other sport can you, can you get into a full-blown fist fight in the middle of the game and then they say we're gonna put you in your room for five minutes yep <laughs> then you can come play again Never every time you get in a fight in any other sport they're like suspending you for games you know this is like we're gonna put you in your you know in the corner for five minutes yeah in baseball you say fuck <laughs> to an umpire and you get kicked out of the game you know <laughs> Oh, yeah, for sure. You got to leave the field, the stadium, the city, maybe even the state. I don't know. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, it's brutal. All right. Well, do we want to get rocking and rolling here? Or since I'm late, now I'm yeah. acting like I'm in a hurry. <laughs> <laughs> You're asking the guy who's sitting over in the corner trying not to fan out if we should just get this thing going. Like, <laughs> you really, you're, you're putting that on me right now. Hey man, I, li- I listened to I listened to every single Seven Dust album this week. As did I for the oh. past fifteen years. Oh my god, you poor <laughs> bastard! Well, I, I've uh, it's all right. I took breaks, but uh, you know, it's uh, it's just what we do here on the show is we'll we'll, we'll digest a discography. Um, yeah, I mean, I've been listening to Seven Dust for, I mean, pretty much most of the time I've been listening to heavy music. It's been that long. And uh, I've just never listened to it all concentrated in one week like that before, <laughs> which yeah. was. Uh, uh, this, this will be educational for me. <laughs> I, gotta, I, I, I mean, there's been so many of them. It's like, oh my god. So Morgan, at some point, if you're like Dan, what did you think about the <laughs> about home? Yeah, because <laughs> yeah. I don't remember. Yeah. <laughs> Right. I had to get educated on home because it was 20 years old. So we we did some home shows and I was like, oh, my God, dude, this song is terrible. I got to learn. How to, <laughs> I got to learn how to play this record again. Yeah. Oh, yeah, totally. We totally had to relearn how to do it. And then animosity is going to come up this year. Dude, next I- year, and then it'll be. Yeah, we'll definitely do it. You know, it's going to be. You know, it's definitely going to be those shows will happen. I mean, it's. We're getting we're getting a little older, so we got to pick and choose, you know, exactly what we want to tackle here. Right. But animosity would be great, man. I'd be like a grown man crying <laughs> saying that show, man. I'd have to go that travel was, a few times. Yeah, that'll be a fun one. I mean, I I do like that record a lot. That was probably the first record that we ever did that I was like, okay, I would, I like this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we were like, That's took us three records for me to say, I think I like my band. <laughs> oh my goodness yeah. and that record has crucified on it it's <laughs> yeah yeah it's kind of yeah, scary how like you know 20 years go by and then you do uh an anniversary for home and then then like you just basically have to go out on tour every year after that to have your whole career again <laughs> just to celebrate the yeah. anniversaries yeah it's trippy i mean seasons will probably be like that too and then you know, by the time, I mean, shit if we're alive you know by that time it'll be you know trying to figure out what the hell i mean are we really gonna do the next 20 year anniversary i don't think so right well, we can do holograms but, now so that we can definitely get you, you get a hologram a, yeah hologram seven yeah days. we can have yeah. you in your 20s up there playing you know oh my god what I'm happens when the 20 year be. of uh south side double wide comes up <laughs> yeah, you just got to play that, it on trash cans at be, that point. That would, that'll be great. That would be great because that's that's easy. You know, the acoustic stuff is is way easier. I mean, that's basically. I mean, I, when we were doing those shows, I would be 
I could be in the dressing room or in the bus. I mean, I'd be like laying down eating and, you know, no getting prepared. There's no, you know, gearing up. I mean, my whole thing is getting ready for shows is, uh, you know, I have a routine because I'm mentally just a mess before we go on. So, you know, by the time we get for a and most of it, you know, there's no fear of playing the concert thing where I don't get butterflies from any of that. I get the nervousness from like, what's going to break on me tonight? You know, am I going to be able to get through the show without fucking dying up here? Wow. So that's really the only thing that gets me. So by the when we're doing the acoustic stuff, I'm like, you know, I don't have anything to worry about. So I'm laying down, eating, watching TV. You know, they're like, hey, dude, you're going on like four minutes. I'm like, oh, all right. Let me just get up, walk in. Oh, nice crowd tonight. Okay, this will be fun. You know, kick back and, and still play hard, but it's just, it's not the same mindset. At least if you break a cymbal at that point, it's your fault. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. So the way we're going to break this one down tonight is number one in the it would taking time to consideration instead of us having a 30 minute conversation about every album, which is like what we usually do. Um, oh, we're going to yeah. we're, we're going to start at the beginning uh, with Seven Dust 1997, and we are going to talk about um, kind of just some interesting tidbits about that album that maybe people that don't people may not know, even if they're longtime fans. The first record was you're dealing with a bunch of kids that are green. I mean, we're so green. We would go in the studios to do those demos. Butch Walker had actually recorded uh, some of the demos that we did uh, before we got a record deal. So we get the record deal and we start recording the day before the Olympics start in Atlanta. And we finished recording the day after they ended. So literally, we were in the studio every single day during the Olympics. It was almost to the day it started, to the day it ended. One day early, we started. So we missed all of the Olympics and everything. But um, it was the first time I'd ever played to a click track or that the band ever did anything like that. I mean, everything was, was a first. So I do remember going in there to track these songs and... Like, LeJean is a really emotional type of singer. He would like to grab the mic and, you know, he could walk around the room with a mic and, and, and record. And obviously that wasn't going to happen. So we were being told that I, he needed to keep his mouth a certain distance from the microphone. Like, he couldn't work the mic at all. So it was really a stale... Everything about that record was kind of stale for us because it was to the grid. It was like, there wasn't Pro Tools or anything back then. We were working right to the tape. So, you know, you needed to get it right. I mean, obviously there's a few tricks around here, you know, you can cut some tape and do this and that. But as far as just, you know, putting it on the grid and lining it up, I mean, that wasn't going to happen. So here I am sitting in there, LeJean singing songs on this record and I'm holding his, like I'm, I'm holding his chin. You know, like, I've got my hand, like, right near him, near his face, you know, while he's tracking vocals for this album because he kept moving away. And, you know, I'm, like, holding, touching the back of his head, like, stay, stay this distance. I mean, it was so insane to think that that was even really a thing. You know, we just had no clue. We had no idea what we were doing, so we were just listening to everything. I mean... You know, tracking the drums was like, here's the click. So just play right on the click. So Tall there, order. Was, there was no, I mean, it, the thing was, is that I was, I was pretty much, I was cool with playing to the click. I'd never done it in my life. And I just took to it really easy. It wasn't a big problem. The only issue with it was that I wasn't able to play behind it a little or ahead of it a little. Like I couldn't play the song with feel. It was all just play that shit dead on, you know, like don't, don't waver from that 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 just stay right there so you know meanwhile i'm thinking yeah man i nailed that click and then you listen back to it and i'm like that is stale stale there is no movement groove in there it's all just right on it but it was a raw record you know it sounded raw um it was just you know our first time in there i mean we didn't have a clue of what was going to happen you know we didn't we didn't think i mean we had 300 people maybe that knew who we were in the world so 
you know, to put that record out and then, you know, two years later, you know, it sold a million and, you know, we've toured the world on it and, you know, it's like, whoa. And I, I had, I left, I had a, a, a dog, a fiance and a house and I came back and I had a daughter, a wife and a condo and the wife wasn't the same girl that I left and the <laughs> oh, condo shit. was you know, not the house, you know, it was like <laughs> my whole life just spun right out, you know, it was like crazy. Uh, Morgan, I have a quick question, man. When, um, when you said you were, you were recording during the Olympics, that remember the Atlanta bombings and everything? There was like a bomb that yeah. went off. Yeah, did you guys yeah. write a song about that or something? Did that make it to lyrics? I mean, I uh, feel like no. Lejean, or not Lejean, but maybe Clint or somebody told me that, that they had incorporated that, that, that bombing or something to some of the, how the record was or one of the one of the songs. I could be wrong, man. I don't, I don't remember that happening, but I mean, it was definitely long enough ago where if somebody else in the band said that that happened, I wouldn't like argue with them. <laughs> I was like, I mean, did you guys go to the Olympics we were, down there? Did, did, I mean, no, we never was, went because we were in the room the entire time. So we never went. I mean, Soundgarden played. I know we went. I, I, I almost want to say that Clint got away. Maybe him and John got away that night to see that. I, I want to say that, but, you know, that's we, awesome. were, we were pretty much locked in there, you know. And we were cool with it, you know. It was this brief moment of, damn, man, we ain't going to see any curling or anything, you know. And then it was, that's all right. You know, we're doing a, a record. You know, we're 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 signed, and we've been trying to do this since we were, you know, teenagers, and now we're we're here. So, even though we still didn't believe that anybody was going to give a shit, <laughs> it was like let's let's at least give it a shot. There's kind of a question on this uh, on this record in particular. You know, I've listened to a lot of bands on on this show over three years, and I, I can tell you. I've never heard a band that had a singer that was so good on the first album, like right out of the box, except like maybe Tool, but you know, or something like that. But like, um, was Lejean always like the very first time you guys like played music together that good of a singer out of the box? Yeah, I mean, his thing was his, he had this strength that was his voice is really wide you know i mean like he he doesn't double a lot of his vocals in the studio you know a lot of times when i mean anytime i'm tracking screaming stuff or backups or anytime that clint's doing any backups or any lead vocal stuff you know that pops in there it's always doubled like we're always doubling you know to build some width and some depth to the to the, you know to our tones and with Lejean, it's almost like there's two sets of voices in there i mean it's thick and it's durable. I mean, he's really only had probably in our career maybe one night that his voice went out. And, you know, we were probably being ridden like, you know, slave driven. I mean, we were I, back then. I mean, I remember doing like 22 shows in 21 days. So, I mean, there's his voice would hold up through that. So, yeah, I wow. mean, he was as far as just being able to go in there and sing. Yeah, he's always had that. I mean, that was that was the attraction when I got him. You know, when I put the band together, that was it. I was like, this dude's cool, and that voice is thick, man. You know, it's aggressive. It's strong, and that that was the thing that like really stood out to me on the first record, especially just because I, I again I just I never hear bands do this well, at least vocally on on their first release. It's it's so uncommon. I mean, I can only right. imagine what you must have been thinking the first time you guys played in a room together. Like, you know, like, oh, my God, I hit a home run. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, it was one of the things about I, I put the band together because everybody was cool. I mean, like that was really the truth of it. It wasn't, you know, I mean, John didn't own a guitar strap. Uh, LeJean, you know, was was doing rock songs, you know, but he was in a band called Body and Soul that was much more like groove oriented in a almost, I mean, it was still rock, you know, but it was kind of like funky. And the guitar player that I got with him because I didn't feel comfortable about pulling Lejean out of his band and leaving him alone with us. You know, I thought we'll have a better chance of getting him if we take a package deal with the guitar player. And he was more of a funky guy, so 
when I got Clinton in the band, that was, it was, you know, I hate to say this, you know, but there was a little bit of method to the madness. I mean, I wanted cool people in the band to start with, and that was what I got. I got guys that, you know, if you were to get lucky enough to get a record deal and have a 20 plus year career, you wouldn't mind living in a hallway with them. And it didn't matter if they were really good. It just, I wanted them to be cool. And then after the coolness was, you know, solidified and everything, it was, okay, you know, we have a shot here. Like, there's something really cool about this. And the only thing that's a little bit sketchy is that this really good guitar player that's playing lead for us is more of a funky guy and I want to be heavier. So that's when I said, we need another cool guy in here, but we need him to be heavier. And Lejean and us had, had built a, a close-knit bond to where he didn't. I didn't think that he would feel like he was all alone. So after like, you know, two years of us doing our, our thing, that's when I went and got Clint. So I, you know, I kind of had that plan for a while. And then when it happened, it was like, yeah, everything happened there. I mean, I had blown my eardrum out when Clint came in to play the first time, so I didn't really hear him, but I had heard him plenty, and I knew, and I just looked around the room. I couldn't hear him, but everybody was like, oh, yeah, when you can hear, you're going to like this. Like, this is <laughs> this is definitely the band now. Yeah, you actually, when you blew your ear out, didn't you puncture it? Like, something with your headphone actually yeah. punched your drum. That's insane, yeah. dude. Yeah, I was at a concert, so I blew it out of the show, and they told me I probably would never hear out of my right ear again, so that was a little bit disturbing, you know. I'm a drummer in a band, and right. I'm only going to be able to hear out of one ear. But it came back. Now it's fucking gone again from 20-something years of <laughs> music. <laughs> but I mean, right. Like that, now I have no hearing in either ear. But. Do you ever have that constant ringing? Like if, if Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. yeah, that's horrible. Eddie Trunk oh. was that like tinnitus oh yeah 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 i have i have to sleep with noise you know or else it'll drive you completely crazy yeah it's same just, here. you know <laughs> like that volume it's screaming loud i'm like wow man that's probably like 102 and db levels right now just in complete silence that's awful joe did you have anything about the uh self-titled or are we ready to move on to home we can start talking about home and the glory that is Toby Wright, because that man is the right man for the job. Hey, we just talked to him a couple weeks ago. That's too crazy. For the self-titled Seven Dust, my 12-year-old ignorant metal brain, which had only recently discovered Metallica, I used to confuse Bitch for a Pantera song. Oh, wow. Because Lejean had cool. this aggressive bark to his voice, which I had only heard Phil Anselmo do at the time. I've always kind of listened to Metallica and Megadeth and kind of the classic thrash bands, but I didn't know it was you until 2001, 2002. I mean, animosity was huge. I started playing drums in 2003, and that's when I went back and said, oh, that's the band. That's awesome. I love these guys. Let me go get the other records, because Seasons 2003 comes out was when I just started taking drum lessons, and I forgot where I was going with this. (laughs) Hang on a second. Um, it's all good to me. Pardon me. I'm talking to Morgan Rose. He's like, tell me more about myself. Yeah. <laughs> My question, man, was, um, and I cannot cite this interview, but you might have said it as a joke. You might have been serious. I was told that in 1997, when you recorded the record, that you were nervous in the studio. So basically, most of the beats on the record you stole directly from the police and Stuart Copeland. Is that true? Yeah, God. And, you know, I vaguely remember saying something about Stuart Copeland, but it was definitely a joke. I mean, I I wish, I wish that I had Stuart Copeland skills, you know. Uh, No, I mean, I was nervous in there because we were being told shit that was really crazy. I mean, I remember being told... If you don't get it right, we'll get somebody else in here to do it. Ugh. Oh I remember hearing that, you know, and I was sitting there going, I mean, you know, it was, it was like J.J. French was the reason for so many things good. I mean, J.J. French was the one that we didn't want to put black on the record. So that's a fact. We didn't want to put the song on the record at all. We didn't want it on there. And he was like, you're crazy. This is going to be your song. And we're going, you're crazy. You know, this song sucks. 
he he made us put black on the record and then not only that but he actually was like we should build an intro and make it the opener for the record so here we go from not even wanting the song on the record to where he's telling us you're gonna put it on there and we're gonna do this intro and that whole but that was all like it was his idea you know to to build that that way so i mean as much as i absolutely despise playing that song and it's definitely not a favorite of mine or anything like that there's no question that that was the song that that semi i mean i don't think this band has ever broken you know but as far as the that that made us noticed at all that got us into the game that gave us a chip in a chair that was the song so without that song i don't even know if you know i don't even know if anybody knows who we are i would have thought that was bitch but that's my yeah. midwest memory yeah bitch was one of the first songs i remember hearing yeah those two were on this little cassette sampler that went out and it was really weird because black was the first song and bitch was the second one so you know black bitch Oh no! And it was like, if that isn't that fucking a racist, shit. Never... I just got that. <laughs> like, that's fucking I'm like, if that isn't fucking racist, I'm like, Jesus, this is so fucking weird. The whole thing was like, you know, coming from a band that again was like so naive to any type of racial issues from from a bunch of our sides. I mean, I remember, uh, you know the label wanting Lejean to make a, a point of getting vocal about, you know, uh, about the white and black thing. And he was like, no, you know, <laughs> How about I don't happen. do that. Yeah. <laughs> and then I remember somebody, uh, asking me in one of the first interviews we did, and I got really offended to it. They said, what's it like having a black singer in a predominantly white genre of music? And I was like, I didn't know that, I didn't really notice that he was black. I mean, I don't, I never looked at it like that, you know? So that's a weird ass question to me. I mean, it, it really bothered me almost at the time, you know, where I was like, that's fucking racist to me. You know I mean? I don't, that just doesn't compute. I was so naive that any of that shit was part of the play, you know? I just was like, you know, I don't, I have zero comment to that because I don't live in that world. I didn't grow up in a household that was, you know, full of bigots and with racial tension or anything like that. I didn't have that problem. So I was, uh, you know, so that was, it was just the whole thing, you know, the, the whole, first record was such a learning experience of who was full of shit and who actually had a clue of what they were talking about and you know that you didn't really have to sit there with the drummer holding the singer's head two inches from the mic while he's saying that wasn't something that was a necessity <laughs> guys this interviewer doesn't know what he's talking about i'm kind of pissed off i'm gonna go buy another arm for my drum rack and add a few toms to it you cool with that yeah, <laughs> yeah right, right. Well, I think what's so offensive, I think what's so offensive too, not like beyond just the racial side of it, though, is the fact that they're just trying to use that to make some money, you know, and that, I don't know, that makes it, that makes it almost worse in a way, you know, where it's like, well, we want to, yeah, we want to capitalize on the fact that there's a black guy in the band singing so that we can, you know, so that pe people will pay attention to us and, um. It's, you know, using it at your guys' weird. expense. Yeah, I mean, I have nothing against uh, anybody wanting to speak their mind. And, uh, you know, I've done it plenty in my career. But, um, you know, I usually try to stay out of politics and religion and, you know, whatever is the, the big thing that's going on that's time to jump on Instagram and pick a side. I'm like, I'll just go ahead and play music because I'm pretty sure that you, you know, the people that give a shit about the band care about, you know, the music. So let's just stick to the music. When, when you guys, um, when you did the second album, were you writing a lot of the lyrics as well? I mean, were you, were you and Clint kind of contributing to the, to all that? I mean, talk about the, the yeah. lyrics. Record. That's when it started to ramp up a little bit more on that end. I mean, you know, we were never going to be a band that, that wrote about uh, partying and, you know, hot girls. And it wasn't 
you know, who let the dogs out lyrics were not going to end up in seven dozen songs. Have and going, huh? What's that? I said you didn't have a Motley Crue, uh, Girls, 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 or nothing like that. <laughs> no, and, and, you know, of course, one of my favorite bands of all time. And again, not at all downing any band that did sing about I me, mean, Van Halen, you know, is like, again, one of my favorites of all time. And I love the songs and I loved them singing about that stuff, you know, but we just weren't going to be that kind of band. I mean, that's okay. You know, I mean, neither is Nine Inch Nails oh, or Tool or Pantera or Megadeth or Metallica. I mean, it's not about you that. I mean, style. Definitely. Yeah. So, you know, and then it started to be, listen, you know, I mean, I think the big thing was, was that, you know, we had our whole lives to, or at least a few years to get together and write a record. And, that included Lejean, you know? I mean, we would sit in there and Lejean come in with words and stuff and he would sing his words and we would add if we needed to and that would be that. And then all of a sudden it was, okay, how long do you guys need off after being on the road for 21 months? And we were like, two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> they're, like, oh. they're like, oh yeah, this is great. You know, the guys are all fucked up. Let's, instead of sending them to rehab, let's go ahead and just let them get back in the studio, you know? So... <laughs> Um, so then it was time to write a record and it was like first just to get the music together was one thing I mean we're literally sitting in a room jamming together and you know grab a riff and go and then it's like okay we think we have a song let's write some words and it's like we're on a timetable now so it's like we're gonna all just grab a notepad and just start going you know whoever can fill in the blanks that's gonna be good you know, we never looked at it like it was one guy needed to do everything. And so that was when that started to happen. And then that was, even though we kind of tapped into the three headed monster of, you know, Clint and Lejean and me doing the three different voices, um, that was when it really started to get ramped up a little bit it was on the second record. You know, there was more of that. And then it gradually got more and more to where we even put on the second record i think that we put on there whose voices you're hearing so if you look at the lyrics you'll see like the liner notes will have our names and it'll be in a font and then when you're reading the lyrics you'll see that font for whoever's singing that's cool i did not know that shows how much i so, read the lyrics yeah. while i was listening to the cd <laughs> you can understand yeah, these I lyrics mean, uh, too. you know the funny thing is is that that's the beauty of the whole thing is that if we did write about some really easier to digest stuff and stuff that was to the point a little bit more i think that it would have been a lot more accessible to people um you know we refused to go in that that direction which then made it to where it just wasn't you know completely blue collar music i mean I think that was, that definitely was something that was happening. Not repeating choruses, you know, not doing chant choruses. Uh, repetitive stuff is always a good idea when writing a song. We never do it. Uh, you know, it's one of those things. I mean, I don't even know where that came from. I mean, our first, the black didn't even the first chorus didn't even hit after the after the first verse. I mean, it was just we didn't everything is never it's always been this you know music shouldn't have rules you know so you do what you want and then as you get going and you get some success then the label is telling you what to do and then all of a sudden it's you know people coming in telling you we need a chorus right here and no 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 that's too much and you're adding this and that doesn't make sense and it's like well it all worked before so but yeah, and this anyway, I'm kind of bouncing all over the place, but this is the second record with Toby was, uh, that was when we started to all get involved a lot more. Is this right before like the new metal wave hit? I mean, I mean, were you guys, were, were the record producer and record company, I mean, were they trying to influence you to be more new metal? I don't, I don't, you know, I will say this. I remember the label saying you have an opportunity right now. What are you? And we were like, we're just groove rock. We're a groove rock band. And they're like, you got to give it a name. We're like, groove rock. And they're like, no, that, that isn't going to work. I mean, it's got to have something. I'm like, they, they use the term metal. And I said, but we're not really just a metal band. And they're like, well, you better come up with something or they're going to label you. Like, the people will label you. 
And we just said, we're not fucking coming up with anything. We are who we are. That's it. You know, we like to think that we're semi-unique, which, again, you know, that's a little aggressive. But, I mean, we just thought we were kind of doing something that was a little bit different. And they said, cool, we do too. What's the name of it? And we just wouldn't give them a name. And then all of a sudden, we're being called New Metal. And I'm like, I don't know what the fuck New Metal is, but we don't have any seven strings. I know that. We're not really rapping which I thought that was new metal. I thought rapping and rocking was rap rock was new metal. Like I still to this day don't even know what the fuck new metal means. I mean, I know that there was new metal. Like I know that there was a handful of bands that we were around with and a handful of them are left. But there was, you know, I still don't really understand it, but I know that it gets, it either gets loved or it gets hated. And I'm like, damn, you know, we're not, but we're not new metal. <laughs> right. You know? And everybody's just like the rapping thing. And like, I'm like, how many rap songs does Korn have? Because they, I mean, Jonathan Davis may rap once or twice here and there, but I mean, he has, he's got a, 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 a particular style. He's not rapping. You know what I mean? It's the, yeah, yeah it's I mean, like Lincoln Clark had a, had a thing where I thought that that was what new metal was. To this day, dude, like, I am, like, the worst person to ask about this because to this day, I'm like, I, I don't know what that means. You want to, I've heard that Lincoln Park is a new metal band. Okay, well, we don't sound like Lincoln Park. So does that mean we're not new metal? And, then, you know, then they're like, well, Corn's new metal. I'm like, cool, we don't sound like them either. I love both the bands, but we don't sound anything like either one of them. Um, are we still new metal? Like, I don't know what the fuck new metal is. I don't get it. But we're not either one of those, you know, so... I think if Lejean is in your band, you're a heavy rock band, which is what you are. <laughs> yeah. Heavy, yeah. progressive, yeah. and rock. You know what we are? We're a fucking gent band. That's what we were, anyway. They ended up giving that a name now. But, I mean, that's really what we were. There's a term for that, you know? Gen, that's gen, awesome. Gen, gen. <laughs> and they're, they're like calling, they're calling bands that now. Like, I mean, I've heard that. And now that's getting kind of ripped apart. And I'm like, oh shit. Well, no, no, no. We're not that either. <laughs> like, I don't know. You know, we're fucking rednecks that play hard rock music. I mean, you know. It, it's interesting how like, so many bands have run from like the new metal thing. Like you think like Deftones. I mean, they they weren't doing family values. They're like... No, we got our own style. We're not going to be pigeonholed, I guess. Yeah, well, that was... The, I, I guess that was it, was Lincoln... Or, uh, Limp Biscuit was was in that pack, too. And then when, again, for some reason, which I still have no idea, like, Limp Biscuit is a kick-ass band. I mean, that's all there is to it. I don't... The musicianship inside the band was always better than most of us. I mean, all of them, you know... Wes, Sam, John, all of them were as good or better than everybody that was going when we were all starting. And then somehow or another, like, that became something that was cool to be mad at, you know? And I'm like, Jesus, you know, just know, yeah. a tough world, man. The music world it is, is tough. It is, <laughs> it is you man. It's like some success, you better watch it. Yeah, yeah. dude. It's like everybody kind of hate on Limp Bizkit. Everybody kind of hate on Nickelback. It's like... I'm scared to be like, man, I hope nobody hates on me, you know? <laughs> just I mean, kinda... it's, we're, we're like sitting in that little under the radar world where, you know, we've been around long enough that our peers, you know, the people that we're close with and all the other bands, uh, we're close with all of them. Uh, we respect them. They respect us. We have a great relationship with all the bands. Um, that was something that came really easy for us, you know, starting out. So we made friends really quick and we kept them. And yeah, and you guys are but, so nice, oh, man. Amazing. Well, thank you, man. I mean, that's <laughs> there's no real reason, you know. There's like no reason not to be. I mean, there's just because they're, you know, you're in a band that's touring, you know. I mean, that shit doesn't mean anything, you know. It doesn't mean anything about your character. I mean, you need to keep that in check for sure. I can't stand bands with with attitudes or anybody that's give it out you know it just freaks me out especially being stuck in like a tour bus with them like you said you know you gotta pick out pick good people to be with cause you're gonna be stuck with them oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah you're gonna have to smell each other's farts for however many hours on the road oh, you know like this is worse than the band 
parts. It's got to be Clint, probably, right? <laughs> he's, he's pretty bad, man. He's pretty healthy, you know. So he's a healthy one, you know. So him and John, John has definitely got the most volume. I mean, he'll just let it fly. <laughs> well, he is the lead singer. <laughs> Crazy. No, not Lejean. John. <laughs> oh man, I misheard you. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I'm pretty sure. I, I mean, this is no kidding. I'm not even <laughs> sure if I've ever heard Lejean actually part. Maybe once or twice ever. I'm so like, glad Lejean this ended is, up in the podcast. He's, <laughs> yeah, he's like private. You know, Lejean's a private fella. He don't. He doesn't do all that. He's clean. You know, he likes to keep everything nice. And everything's clean and smells good and all that so that's he keeps a good in the zone deal. John yeah 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 he likes the zone I'm the fucking zone killer <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's what Uncle Vinny said I'm the zone killer yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. we're like wow. banshees uh, <laughs> I'm going to try to somehow steer the ship back on course. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. This is, so, I'm dangerous. So I'm a dangerous guys, interview, man. Right. So uh, <laughs> you guys were uh, you guys were talking about metal, and unfortunately I was having some technical difficulties during that. I kept trying to chime in and nothing. Uh, but uh, we, uh, you know, whenever you say, you know, well, we're not really like a straight metal band, metal, metal is still definitely very much in there. I mean, that like, I probably wouldn't have even listened to you guys if, you know, there wasn't, you know, some level of, of heaviness or extremity. Because I would, course. I would almost even say calling it hard rock is short selling it. Because I mean, even on your guys' newer albums, you know, there's still a lot of that. You know, uh, double bass. You know, um, machine gun guitar. You know, <laughs> we embrace the the metal part of it. You know, I mean, it's it's no problem. You know, we we love. The, I mean, that was. That's part of our heritage, you know, as, you know, Judas Priest and Iron Maiden and Metallica and all that stuff. I mean, we're, we're metalheads for sure, uh, but we weren't just that. I mean, I, I had marked it down to this, what had happened during Animosity, which was we went out and we did shows with Slipknot. And then we went straight from that and we went and we did a tour with Creed. And then we turned around and we did like, you know, Warp Tour or something. That was that was the second record. But I mean it was it was literally like Warp Tour to Slipknot to Creed. And I just sat there and I looked around and I said, Okay, we were just on Warp Tour with Blake one eighty two and M and M and uh you know, Lit and a bunch of these bands, you know. None of them would be cool playing with Creed or Slipknot. And then we went and we played with both of them, you know? And I was like, but then Creed and Slipknot would not be good together either. So then it became this real issue. Then it was like the beginning of that feeling was, oh man, we're so versatile that we can do all of this. And then it started to feel like, wait a minute, we would do the shows and the Creed people would think that the fucking devil just walked in the room and was about to send them straight to hell. Right. <laughs> and then we'd go out with Slipknot and they would be like, ah, oh, fucking Bon Jovi's on the stage. So I was like, <laughs> oh man, this is fucking terrible. Like what we thought was so cool is now turned into they're too heavy for Creed and they're not heavy enough for Slipknot. And I was like, damn, you know, we've got a problem here. Like we've got, we, we haven't, chosen sides because that's not what kind of band we are you know we're we are diverse the only other band that i knew that was really like that even though they probably wouldn't be a great match with you know with all those bands was the deftones you know and they chose their own path i think that was the the right move you know they distanced themselves from a lot of stuff and they went with bands that were completely in another stratosphere you know like they would bring bands out with them that you know wouldn't be playing with any of those any of the other bands and the genre they were being pigeonholed into so we instead you know would bring out whoever we could find that was starting to make a, a jump at radio and who would do good you know fitting into what we thought was going to match well with what we did and uh yeah so that was how it turned out we headlined for a really 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 long time because we realized that the only few bands that we could go out and tour with that we would match up well with would be bands that were you know the corns the 
the Disturbs, the Godsmacks, you know, those bands we could go out and play with and those people would be like, yeah, I don't know who the hell this is, but, you know, this fits into the genre. We've argued for years that Deftones is kind of the only band that has their own genre. Everybody calls it new metal, but yeah. nobody sounds like Deftones. Seven Dust, right. when I've been asked what genre you are, my answer is always, it kind of depends on what song you're listening to, but the components yeah. that make up the band are like taking a rubber band and stretching it in five directions to the extreme. 311 is the prime example for me of hybrid music. Seven Dust yeah. is kind of like heavy hybrid music because nobody is playing the drums the way you are, the guitars the way Clint is, and then singing the way Lejean is, except for Seven Dust. Yeah, I like that. I mean, that that would have been useful in 1997. <laughs> <laughs> All you had to do was come to St. Louis and ask for the twelve-year-old kid down in the corner. Hey, dude, what are we? What do we sound like? This kid knows what's going on. The twelve-year-old the 12 year <laughs> had it figured out. I mean, that, that's that's pretty much it. I mean, when people would ask us, you know, what are your influences? Every guy had a different one. You know, Vinny would say Leonard Skinner. I would say, you know, Nine Inch Nails or Pantera. Clint would probably say Nine Inch Nails or Pantera or something, and John would say Earth, Wind, and Fire, right. and John would say Metallica, you know? So it's like everybody had a different thing, and then we were all involved, so obviously that's the only originality you're really going to get. I mean, you can, the originality to me is really just, it's all the same shit, but it's like how you're going to put those ingredients together you know i mean there have been people definitely that play like me and before and after and there's been people that play all the instruments the way that we do before and after we haven't done anything very special it's just you get five guys and you put us all in the room and then you know it becomes something that it's like oh okay well those influences that ingredient that that cake has something in it that i didn't taste yesterday with that, uh, you know, with with that dichotomy of like we're not heavy enough for Slipknot, but we're too heavy for Creed. Is that why animosity was so much? It, it at least to me se seemed to be so much more aggressive uh, than the previous two albums, which could have just been like a difference in production value. But the just the songs seemed more energetic and more pissed off overall. Um, we were definitely pissed off for sure. We had sold a lot of records and we hadn't made any money. And we were in a position where it didn't look like we were going to ever get out of that situation. So, you know, the whole record starts with, you know, oh God, you piece of shit. Oh God, you piece of shit. You <laughs> right. know? And tits on a bore is, you know, something that my nanny used to say, you know, you're useless as tits on a bore. And, so that's like where that T-O-A-B sits on a bore. And that was directly assaulting people that were in the in in the band lives at the time that we were like, how in the fucking world could we just go out there and sell almost two million records and play for 40 months almost and literally don't have any money? Like, it's fucking crazy. So... That was an aggressive record. It also took us a year to do it because, you know, some of us were a train wreck. So that record cost about a million dollars to make because we were living in condos and rehearsing. And it was just like doing a little more having fun than working sometimes. So we had the time. We were able to live with it. Um, we were able to live with the songs as opposed to like some of the more recent records you know i mean we did some of the records in like three or four weeks like wrote them and recorded them in three or four weeks and we're sitting there laughing going gee dude, it took us a year it took us a year to write and record this record so but yeah that was like the first time we had big production i mean and we had told toby that we wanted something that was a little raw and we wanted something that was lo-fi and we actually were trying to fall into that Ross Robinson-esque, like, corn world where it was, like, raw. And then by the time the record came out, it was like, no, big-sounding shit is what we want now. And we're like, oh, damn, but the record's really not like that. You know, that record is, is just a raw record. Mm. 
So, yeah, when we got to Animosity and Ben Gross got in the room, it was like, this thing's going to sound big as shit. Are you cool with that? We're like, yep. <laughs> it was like, like all the guitars were like, yep. Like fucking arena drums. I'm like, uh-huh. You know, and it was big as fuck. You know, I mean, it, that record was big sounding. And uh, we've led ourselves and we've been led blind into some areas that were just like crazy. I mean... Let's go really big sounding. Okay, well, let's go with a big, you know, songwriting help because, you know, I mean, again, we were green. We didn't understand what the hell is this producer doing? We wrote the song. The song sounds exactly the same way that we wrote it. We told, you know, this guy what tones we wanted and we just paid him a fucking shitload of money. You know, so then we're like, we don't need any of that. And that's like, well, wait a minute. Maybe we need a producer that is like a song guy. So then we get Butch to come in and Butch is like fucking unbelievable. You know, I'm kind of scatting through animosity, man. but Butch is the man. Like, Butch walks in and it's like, oh, I got this chorus, bam, bam, bam. And I'm like, oh, shit. Yeah. I'm like, he goes, well, maybe that's a little too much. Why don't we do this? Bam, bam, bam. He's got a nom. I'm like, oh, damn, he just threw two choruses out that blow anything I could do away in like 30 seconds. So, I mean, Butch was so funny. It was like, we'd go in the room and we'd be working on someone like, man, what about that chorus though? And he goes, that's going to be great. It's going to be great. And I'd be like, okay, but we don't have one. He goes, don't worry about it. It's going to be great. You know, like, he was just so cool. You know, like, he had that shit down. And uh, and then he blew up. You know, like, he became really big after that record. But, yeah, he was, I mean, that's the difference, though. You have a guy like Toby, who Toby's a motivator. Toby's the kind of guy where I could do a really good take on, on the uh, home record. And he would get on the talk back and tell me that's the worst take that you've done yet and i would be thinking to myself i'm the most i'm the hardest you know i'll critique myself harder than anybody so i know in my mind even if i might have slipped somewhere in my mind i'll be the one that will say before anybody else that was shit and i and he would say that and i'm like i, I thought the take was perfect i'm like are you out of your fucking mind so then i would get <laughs> like we would go at it and then, you know, I smashed snare drums in there. I would kick shit around and leave the studio for five minutes, come back, and I'd play harder. And he goes, yeah, that's the one. <laughs> and then LeJean would go in there, and LeJean would go into the booth, and he'd sing something that, you know, it might be flat as a fucking board, and I'd be like, oh, no, that's a bad note. And he would say, man, that was so amazing. He goes, give me one more of those. That's, like, amazing. And I'm sitting there looking at him going, are you on fucking drugs, dude? <laughs> like, you know, you're like, I need to go in there and the hold his face. His, yeah, I'm like, but the method to his madness is he knew, you know, Morgan is the aggressive one. If I push Morgan, Morgan will do better when he's angry. And then if I coddle this guy or if I treat this guy with a little bit more of a kid glove feel, he's going to be confident and cool and he's going to give me what I need. So I learned everything from these guys. You know, there was that. There was us going into animosity again. I I'm still don't know what the fuck I'm doing. And I go in there and Ben is like, we're doing pre-pro for the record. And we go through like praise. And I'm playing it and he stops and he goes, okay, that's really good. He goes, Morgan, why don't we simplify that that verse a little bit? You know, let's just, let's just back it up a little. Just like, you know, give me a little bit of this. You know, and I'm like, okay. So we do it and he goes, yeah, yeah, that sounds great. That's perfect. I'm like, okay. We go to the next song. He's like, yeah, man, it's sounding great. There's more than, why don't we simplify that chorus there? That kick drum's kind of flying around a little. Why don't we just simplify that chorus a little? I'm like, all right, go to the third song. Morgan, and, uh, and before he could even say, I'm like, are you going to fucking say anything to anybody else, dude? Like, am I, do you even know how I play drums? Like, you're fucking shutting me out of the, of, I'm not comfortable. So I, like, attack him. And next thing you know, he doesn't say anything to me again about playing <laughs> drums for the rest of the record. Nothing. Jeez. And then after he gets to bass, he's like, now he's tearing Vinny apart. And then he gets to John and Clint and he's kind of tearing them apart. And I'm going, oh. So he was just going to go like song by song with me and then go to the next guy. And okay, so now I'm the asshole, you know, which I was. I didn't know what was going on. I hadn't had it done like that before. But I'm sorry fucking I'm an asshole you know I didn't know what to do so you know that's his thing was sonics you know uh, Ben was the kind of guy that would say ah that chorus is eh and I'd be like what do you got and he'd be like I don't really have anything I'm just telling you I don't like it 
<laughs> and then, so I'm like, that would be the kind of thing that we wanted to like kill each other in the band. If somebody, I mean, it was so stupid because it, that can easily be the case. You don't have to be a songwriter to tell somebody that you don't like something. But if somebody in our band would come into the room and go, man, I don't like that chorus. Okay, what do you got? Well, I ain't got nothing. Well, then shut up. Like, that's how we were to each other. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then, wow. You know, and then Ben comes in and he says that, and we're like, oh, like you're about to get fucking choked out. You know, like, it was, <laughs> I don't like it. We I don't know what you should do you to know, fix it, but I know I don't like it. Yeah. Yeah, that was it. So, I mean, but that was, that was what I learned, you know? It went from guys that were... You know, like Toby, who were very motivating and knowing personalities. And then you've got guys like Ben, who is, you know, I don't even really think we got everything from Ben because I fucking was an asshole to him. But he made that record sound better than any record, you know, we had ever done. And then you go to Butch, who is like, you guys can do all the craziness you want to do, but this song is going to be a great song. And he was a tunesman, you know. He came in there and could could make, uh, you know, could shine a turd quicker than anybody. I mean, we'd come in there with something average, and he would come in and sing something, and it would be like, oh, okay, you, you got us on the path, so we'll take it from here. <laughs> so, you know, Butch is just a songwriting fool. So that was like our three in a row, you know, going from home to animosity to season. I think most people consider Animosity to be your best record, but they say that Home is their favorite record. My favorite record is Seasons, which is when I found you. <laughs> that's, so that's a great album, man. Like, that's my second favorite. But before we get there, I have to ask, because this record has Angel Sun on it, Yeah. what can you tell me about Lynn? Oh, I mean, like that was the first person that we had lost as a band you know that we were really close to because that that band was they were just like us but from the west coast i mean we were we were the same personality wise we were very alike we were both pretty out of control very aggressive um but very respectful and nobody wanted to fuck with us like no bands wanted to take us out um you know, we ended up going out with each other because nobody wanted to go out with either one of us. So we would just go out and play sometimes in front of 50 people, 100 people, and we didn't care. We loved it. We, we basically got in the buses, and back then, you know, it was like shit, RVs and vans, and we would get in them and just drive and just tour. I mean, we were touring the whole country over and over for months and just keep playing every day and flip flop going on, you know, laugh back and forth. And I really didn't want to go on after them. I mean, they would just devastate a crowd. So they they made us who we were. I mean, we felt like we were a good live band and then we saw them and went, oh shit, you better fucking eat some more Wheaties because they were really <laughs> tearing shit apart. And so then it was like, okay, we're going to go after it hard. And, uh, and I think that was what really did it for us. I mean, because then there was no Slipknots. There was none of that was happening. Even back then, there was no Godsmacks or Disturbs or Shinedowns or any of that. There was none of that was happening. You know, this is before all that. There was Machine Head, of course, you know. I'm not talking about like the Megadeths and Metallicas that had already paved the way. Just like bands that had come out around then was like, you know, Machine. I mean, I remember coming off the Roar Tour and it was like, you know, we're playing with the Nixons and and sponge and shit like that which was you know again very cool just not at all our genre and we were just fucking mutilating people you know i mean we felt like we were bullying people and then here comes snot and it's like ooh, this is somebody we can't push around at all so it was fun you know we, we would smack each other around every night and then we would sleep half of us would be on one vehicle and half would be on the other so it was like half snot half seven dust on both vehicles uh, I hung out with Lynn and J with Lynn and Jamie, and then uh, and Sonny a lot, and then Clint would hang out with Mikey a lot. So, but Lynn was, you know, obviously a brother and really, really close with us. And so when he passed away, um, and the song was written for the Straight Up record, that was during the Home record. That was actually during the the writing of the Home record. And 
I know that we were on tour because our tour manager, Dennis at the time, came back and said, I just got a phone call that Lynn died in a car wreck. And it was like, so it was the end of the first record, very end of our first record touring was when we found out that he had passed away. And then during, uh, after we had after we had recorded Home was when they had come in and said, let's do, you know, the straight up record. And they asked if you know, they wanted us to be involved. So me and Clint and Lejean went to the studio and Clint had that piece of music. And if you really listen to it, you can hear there's a song called Insecure on the home record that's just a really an intro to reconnect and it's basically it's basically angel sun like that's the song like that riff is angel sun it's the intro so when it was time that was originally going to be a song and then when the straight up thing came about then clint put that music together and uh him and Lejean had some vocals that they put together in the studio, I think. And I was there, and we did it, and then the fucking label wanted us to put it on Animosity. And we didn't want to, because... I was going to ask already... you, why wasn't Sonny included if it was something that you wrote together? That's uh, Sonny was in there. Sonny was in there when we did it with... Uh, when we did it for Straight Up, Sonny was in there. Sonny was in there, Mikey was in there, Tuma was in there. The only two people that weren't in the room were Lynn and Jamie. Lynn, you know, obviously, and, and Jamie wasn't there. But Sonny and uh, and Mikey were in there. They all played on it. Sonny didn't play, wasn't involved in the video because, uh, well, you're going to have Sonny, so you can have Sonny. <laughs> I know why, but I, but I don't get into all that shit. Sonny's my dog, and I'll just let him answer that. <laughs> How's he doing, by the way? Sonny's awesome. Sonny's Excellent. doing great. Yeah. I mean, I miss Sonny, and I love Sonny, and he's, you know, that group of people, even though we don't see them all the time, and Lynn is gone, uh, you know, that's, that for sure is the most, that's the closest we ever were to anybody in the industry and it happened right away you know I, I remember meeting them in new york when we weren't even touring together and we just happened to be in the same city and we met them on like the radio people that were working for us it's not in town and their people told them and they said we want to meet them you know it was like we loved each other right away i mean we met each other in the street and ran to each other hugging each other and had never met before so we had a love affair with that band. I mean, that band was was and will always be the you know the the special band for us because we did it together when no one would give either one of us a shot. But uh, yeah, so then we go to Animosity and record label says we want to put Angel Sun on the record and we're like we already did our tribute to Lynn. We've already done the song. There's already been a video, and we already put him and Dobbs in the home record. The song's already been done. And our label president was pissed that we had written a song that was not gonna be on our record, so he wanted his shot at it. And we're like, you can't release that song. The song's already been out there. You know, like, can't re-release the song. So he didn't really re-release it, but he wanted it on the record and he forced it onto the record. And then we ended up in Canada doing a video for it that was actually like, you know, really fucked up and and eerie, and it was obvious that it was, you know, it, it could pertain to Lynn, and it wasn't cool to me. I thought that doing it in a hospital and having a mother, you know, running into the hospital while her son has, you know, been in a situation and is in the, I, I just thought the whole thing was fucking tasteless, to be honest with you. I mean, I regretted that immediately, and there was really not much we could do about it because at the time, you know, we were slaves to the fucking system, and that was the way it was going to be. I think the campfire said it all, right? Yeah, that was the good shit, you know? And even that was, you know, you can ask Sonny about that again because I, I respect Sonny immensely, and his decision not to be involved in that part of it was... I have no idea where he would think about that right now, but knowing him uh you know 
I don't know. I mean, I missed him being there, but uh, but I totally respected his decision not to be. And um, and then I ended up in a situation, you know, like I said, fucking recording and playing a song on a record that we'd already done that was built for someone in particular. And before you knew it, we're fucking filming videos that are separate from the campfire video. And it's just, you know, I don't know. But what was supposed to be such a beautiful thing dedicated to a beautiful person, you know, ended up being yet another way that the people trying to make money could go in there and suck some more blood out of the system. And it was just fucking tasteless, so... But yeah, yeah, that can be pretty offensive. That's that. yeah, like when somebody's just again like trying to trying to just capitalize on something that you know really really didn't exist for that reason, you know. Yeah, I mean the song ended up taking on a life of its own, you know. At that point, you know, people start passing away and they start dedicating that song to them, and you know we've done it plenty of times live to people and for people and stuff like that, and. So it's the song's gotten a whole lot of mileage out of it, and unfortunately, you know, it was written for our brother. So I will tell you, it's a good song. It deserves the credit it gets for being as meaningful as it can be. I honestly don't know what to say at that point, but it's not. I thought was a hidden treasure that I knew about for years, oh, yeah. and again teenage ignorance i didn't know that's what angel sun was about until south side double wide yeah so once i learned that i said oh these guys used to run with seven uh seven dust that's even cooler because then i find the snot live record which has lynn in the raw and the straight up record which i like I don't think all the songs are great, but I don't think the purpose of the record was to write the great songs. It was to be there for Lynn. So I'm yeah. thankful for it. Yeah, definitely. You ready for seasons, Dan? Oh, Scott's dude, back with us. I was born ready. Yeah, we lost yeah, Scott for a couple minutes. <laughs> hang on, hang on. Here <laughs> Sorry, we go. Y'all. Hang on. Here we go. Here we go. Because Scott thinks Fozzie's. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I fell asleep at Animosity, but that's the wrong album to fall asleep on. Well, you know, Scott, you know, we just know that Scott loves Fozzie more than he loves Seven Dust, so you know, we got it all he's on, on. He's on his way. I can hear him. He's on his way to Fozzie right now. <laughs> oh, yeah, dude. I can see him on video. He's on a, he's in a fucking car heading right heading to the show. He's got what? he's, he's got all his Seven video. Dust vinyls in his lap. It's hilarious. I did it right there. <laughs> <laughs> right when we tried to play two, that lost I was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, uh, it's awesome. uh, home. Uh, this was just like we're at seasons, dude. But no, oh, I'm not not home. Sorry, seasons. <laughs> my bad. <laughs> Drunk. Yeah. I've not. I've had a few now. Uh, no, I have a huge question. I'm sorry, man. Um, when you guys did animosity and when you did seasons, you guys had like songs that you cut for movie soundtracks, like Leech. And I think that was on yeah. Freddy vs. Jason. Amazing song. Yeah. That's like one of my favorite Seven of songs, man. What made you guys not I love decide that. to put it on the record? It was, again, zero to do with us. Zero. Like, the label at that point, there was such... Uh, they had so much control that... And, you know, and again, we were still learning. I mean, we, we were believing back then i mean the system back then was completely different than it is now i mean with the internet and streaming and you know i mean we were like the little engine that could you know we had a label that did spend some money but we were going up against the big dogs you know i mean if you look at every other band in our genre that was succeeding back then they were all going off of majors and we were on an indie so we were beating you know bands that were on majors well some of those bands were surpassing us with big money. And I mean talking, you know, buying end caps at, you know, at Tower Records and billboards and shit everywhere and doing spending big, big money to promote. And uh, and we would promote and then we would stop promoting. And that was the idea from the labels end was we have this much money to spend. We'll front load it. We'll see what we get. And then we'll do our best at radio. I didn't mean to jump right back into animosity, but you guys also in seasons, you had a couple of like Japanese songs like Rain and Number One and Coward. Those songs are amazing. Man. Yeah, that, that must be hard cutting those from the, the you know cutting them here and making Japanese versions of them. Yeah, that kind of sucked because it was actually like, I mean, that was when I started to really get into to writing 
as many vocal parts as I could. Like I went in and actually recorded Coward, uh, number one, and one other song just by myself. Like I went in with John and I'm not even sure if Clint was there. I'm, I mean, he, I, he would have had to have been there, I think, but I know that uh, for sure me, John, and Vinny would go in and track that stuff with Sean Grove, and then I would go in and just sing all the vocals. I'd write the, you know, the, the lyrics and then go and sing the parts. And then, you know, some of the songs, you know, some of them made the record, but, you know, John would go back in and sing and put his thing on it. There's so many good songs on this record. There's Enemy, there's Disease, Seasons, Broken Down. I'm not just reading the track listing, I swear. Burned Out's not on here, steady. Suffocate, Face to Face. I love this record. I really do. Every song could be a single. I mean, you think about, like, Gone, man. That's a, such an amazing song, Burned Out, Suffocate. Just like you said, it's like every song sounds like a radio hit. It's amazing. Well... We were either going to do it or Butch was going to do it, and that was just the deal. I mean, it just became that where it was like we knew that the bar was going to be set pretty high on writing hooks because Butch was there. So it was like, you're not going to phone this shit in anywhere. You're not going to come with your first thing, you know, and just think that's going to be the way it goes. Like, it's going to go around the table. And knowing that Butch had something in his pocket that was probably going to beat whatever we did, instead of it making us lazy, it made us work harder. And I think he made us better songwriters, you know, without question, because his level was already way up. Was uh, Clint pretty burned out at this point? I mean, this is right before he left. I mean, could you see signs of like wear and tear, like he's about calling it quits? I mean, I don't. I don't think that it was happening during the writing and recording of that record. Um, I think that it happened afterwards. And then, like I said, I mean, we've all had our battles and done our stuff, and some more than others, some not much at all. But I can only speak for myself in telling you that I had some decent problems that probably should have been getting addressed on and off, uh, you know, through all that time. And, you know, Clint had as well. And he's made it, you know, it's he's made it, uh, you know, public. He's been sober for a long time. And I'm like, he's like a fucking champion to me. I mean, he's, you know, I love him dearly. And he's no question, you know, me and him think the same way when we're writing so he's always been really easy to write with I really have a good time writing with John as well like we can we can knock stuff out really quick melodically me and Clint are really dialed and I think rhythmically me and John are um, but yeah I think that right around the end of that was when it was probably there was a peak problem going on and uh, you know there were a lot of people that were coming at Clint and telling him, you know, that he could do better and telling him that, you know, they had a better opportunity and things like that. And, you know, he was to say he was vulnerable was a fucking understatement. I mean, so, yeah, he got fucking taken from us. And, um, you know, I mean, it, it all worked out. Uh, but yeah, it was a really tough time. I mean, that was that was a extra tough time. I definitely think it's a bad day anytime a band loses a member. In 2005, though, you were down Clint. Sonny was in the band, and you did what I believe is the first and only self-produced record. Next. Well, no, we've done a bunch of them self-produced since then, but Next was, like, the first one. You know, I mean, Sean Grove was, was there, and he, he had, you know, absolutely had produced as much as, for sure, some other people that had gotten producer credit. So, I mean, I think that it... I'm, I'm pretty sure, like, I haven't looked at that in a long time, but I would hope that it says produced by Seven Dust and Sean Grove. But, um... Either way, he he was, you know, Sean Grove is another saint, you know, that just was totally there and 
totally uh, motivating and was involved in doing the, I think the one thing that, that Sean Grove hates more than anything in the world is that he was never able to work on a record that Clint was on because he's a guitar guy and he loves Clint and he likes the trinkets he likes all that extra counter melody shit and Clint is the fucking greatest on the planet at it so I think that that was the thing that Sean really was bummed out about, but Sean killed it on those records, you know. Some were better than others, but it had nothing to do with him. I mean, we just, you can probably go through three, these three records really quick, and I'm sure Scott wouldn't mind either. <laughs> <laughs> right. No, I, I mean, love it was song. like, you know, the next record was like The Hangover from Clint. There was still, we had actually been writing for that record with Clint. Um, oh, wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, it started that way. I mean, the song Brother on the Dark New Day record was another song that we had actually been screwing around with at Soundcheck. Wow. So when I, heard, when I heard that, I wanted to fucking kill people. You know, I was right. like, wait a minute, dude. So I, I, was, I jammed that song, you know, like, and it's your first single. You know, I was like, oh, man, if that song goes big, I'm going to be pissed. But there were songs that, you know, we had started screwing around with when you know this was all happening i mean like the dark new day thing when we were writing next uh and still kind of touring the end of seasons that was when the infidelity was happening you know that was when you know we would be like off for a little while and then clint would go somewhere and he would track guitars for the dark new day thing and it, i think it kind of started out you know the whole thing was like this fucking snowball where it started out as just a side thing and then it turned into this could really be a thing and then managers started to get involved and money started to get involved and we were in a position where we were stuck at a record company that was fucking eating us alive and uh so i mean i don't even know if i would blame him for going at the time but yeah that was uh so we go in and did next and the hangover of it was hey we still have some ideas here that were being written with him around so i think you can kind of hear that there's still a melodic side to that that was oh absolutely left over yeah and, yes I and love then you get big on melodic i love that song sorry yeah and that was like you know shit that was when me and John started to go completely rogue. You know, it was like John would fly to Atlanta and he would be like, he would stay at my house and we would like go to a, this blockbuster and sit in this parking lot because I had written like the lyrics to a few songs there and a few melodies, like the lyrics and melodies to a few songs back in the day, like Enemy I wrote in there and a few other songs and we had been doing this for a while where John would come when we were doing records in Atlanta he would come and stay at my house and then after we would be done with the night me and him would sit down like I had written the chorus to uh, to Broken Down that we were having trouble with and I didn't even know it was any good because me and John got drunk that night and recorded it and John let Butch hear it the next day was about to get bounced from the record and Butch was like, who the fuck wrote that? He goes, Morgan wrote it last night drunk. And he was like, dude, that's oh, cool. Wow. So, so that was like, me and John would do that kind of thing. So we get to, I'm kind of speeding on past Next a little bit. But when we were doing Next, it was that was the beginning of that Rogue thing where it was just like, you're here, I'm here. So we're just going to sit in this parking lot and we're going to write these songs. So we would sit there and just play it for a minute be silent, sit there with a notepad and just knock out words and kind of hum some melodies and then go back to the house and kind of hum them out and then get to the studio the next day and sing them and be like, is that good enough? Okay, cool, it's good, let's go on. So that was that was working for a while, that worked through next. And then we got to Animosity and I was just like on a mission, you know, where it was like, these fucking songs are saying something to me and it feels like I just want to talk about me. And right now I want to fucking kill somebody and then I probably want to do something bad to myself. I mean, I was probably not really that healthy in the mind at the time. 
And um, so that record just started to get really, it started to turn into like this concept record and it was really starting to freak me out that I was writing everything about me. And then I was handing it over and Lejean was getting it and looking at it like, this ain't me, dude. <laughs> you know, like I'm not down with torturing this motherfucker that I don't know that you're singing about, you know, and he did an admirable job, you know, singing my life story there for a minute. But I mean, that was kind of like when that record was over and John left, because um, we had spent a few months together every day, every day, you know, doing the same routine and being that I was not really in a great place, it was pretty awesome to, uh, you know, to have him there. And then I remember the last day, uh, I just remember him like leaving and from the studio and I got in my car and was driving home and pulled off the side of the road and just like fucking collapsed, you know, mm. just emotionally just broke down because I was like, okay, I've been going through this therapy for the last two months, you know, with my dude right next to me and now I'm being left alone and tomorrow I have to just deal with it, you know, like I had been, you know, writing these songs and we'd been recording this and creating this and it was really therapeutic and I didn't realize how important it was and how needed it was as just, you know, selfishly for me at the time until, uh, you know, it was over. So that was pretty heavy. And then, uh, you know, we just kept firing records out. I mean, it, to be honest with you, yeah, you it did. was this thing where we had a fucking another monster of a motherfucker that we were dealing with, and we had been fucking robbed on that end. And so we fired that shit, and we're like, we got to go fucking do another record, dude. Like, we, we need to go... We knew that we could make a little bit of money and have another way to tour because at this point we're signed to our own label through ADA, which, you know, let's get real. It was called Seven Brothers Records and the only records that Seven Brothers Records ever put out were Seven Dust Records. <laughs> you know, it was it wasn't it wasn't a fucking record company, you know. It was an it was an imprint that we were able to use to go and have somebody distribute our records at a, you know, at a percentage. And, you know, then we could use their uh, infrastructure for a, for a fee, you know. So we were flipping the bill for everything. So the fact that we were able to stay alive for three records is fucking crazy. Even more, because actually we, we were with, you know, that type of setup where we were paying for everything we were we were in that setup for every record up until the last one like from next until we got to the last record until we got to all i see is war we were basically on our own so you know not to say that the people that were working with us weren't fantastic and great people it had nothing to do with that it had to do with the fact that we weren't a record company we didn't have the money to be able to reinvest in our product and be able to pay the bills. So it turned into this thing of better do another record, better do another record, you know, and before you know it, you know, it's like, dude, I got nothing else to say. Like, I don't have any fucking songs left. So John, you know, writes all these riffs and I come in and we're all sitting in a room trying to put together songs and we're doing Hope and Sorrow and like, there's like three songs on that thing that I can really deal with you know it just wasn't fucking happening it was like i've i've lost you know i don't have it like i just i'm tired and i think john was too i think that it was like he was the primary riff writer at that point i think that we both kind of looked at each other and i was just like dude i need clint back in this band like fucking now you know like it just it, it has to happen this is this is not a Sonny thing. Sonny is fucking unbelievable. I mean, easiest dude on earth to love. Great guitar player. Really good songwriter, too. Like, there was nothing wrong with Sonny. It had zero to do with that. Like, it wasn't that at all. It was that Clint was, he was our dude. Right. You know, Clint was our brother, and, and Sonny was our first cousin, you know, and 
and we we knew what we needed to do to be able to fire this train back up and clint had gotten sober and was doing well and uh so yeah once we got done with that hope and sorrow record we didn't even we hadn't even toured the fucking thing yet and it was like there's too much there's too much going on right now like there's too much talking going on right now I mean, this is going to turn into something that's going to be weird and, you know, we couldn't hold the record back. So it was like, we're going to do it now. We're going to pull the trigger now, which, again, is just typical fucking Seven Dust where it's like, okay, so you got your original guitar player back in the band and the day after you announce that he's back in the band, you release a CD with the guy that replaced him the track on that record with his picture in it. It's so fucking wrong and twisted and dysfunctional and fucked up. You know, there was nobody that was like taking care of us that had any clue. Like they were just, they didn't give a shit. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. Like, let's go, you know, just dumb. So we released that record. Could not wait to get done with that cycle. Like could not wait to hurry up and be done with it so that we could get into the studio with Clint and do Cold Day Memory. And do what you wanted to do. And yeah. Then, yeah, like, you know, and have, and, and you know, I think that it worked. I, I love that record. I mean, I, I love that record. I was probably, you know, the second most fucked up I'd ever been, maybe the most, the most fucked up I'd ever been in my life doing that record. I'd gone through a divorce and... You know, really kind of uh, just fucked up, you know, what would have been a really cool thing, you know, to go in with my boy and have us put this record together and kind of have my shit together. So here Clint walks into the studio and he's sober and driven and excited and he's got his band back and he's ready to put his shit together. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to go to the bar. (laughs) I'll see you guys. I'll see you guys guys when I try not to wake you up. Yeah, I mean, there's little pieces in there that show me not looking too presentable, you know. And the but ones. at the end, yeah, man, I was, it was about one of those a day. So it's like, wow. you know, um, but we got through it, and the record, you know, somehow or another, I became a functioning drinker that was able to like go to bed at seven in the morning and wake up at noon and do what I had to do and then go back out at midnight or one and do that until six in the morning. Was that hard like that? No, I didn't hear you. Was it hard with what? But was it hard when you were going through that situation and having Clint, you know, your brother that's complete opposite end being sober? I mean, was he trying to like talk to you and try to, I mean, was he coaching you along? I mean, were you guys tight? No. We were very close, but Clint was, you know, in all honesty, I mean, when 100% transparency here, I don't remember. I really don't. I mean, I, I remember somebody called me the King of Chicago, and I said, I like that name. And, <laughs> it, and then that stuck for a while, you know. That stuck to where, I mean, it was just, crazy it was it was so flipped you know where now clint was you know he had john and john and him were really focused and and the other guys were doing i mean Vinny kind of came to be like my crutch Vinny was like all right i'll take the fucking i'll hold this dude's hand while he fucking implodes real quick and uh the other guys you know went on with their business and did their work and saved the record and made it a really good record I mean, I contributed. It's not like I was gone and then I came in and threw up on the drums and said, fix it. You know, I mean, I <laughs> I put my time in and did it. But you can hear it in Clint's voice when he's doing the videos. He goes, when Morgan's here, he's here. You know, when he does that King of Chicago thing, you know, he deserves it. When really, I think I fucked him. You know, I think that he was like, damn, man, you know, you got me back in this and I'm happy to be here and excited. And then you kind of deserted me. And to be honest with you, I've kind of deserted him on every record since. You know, this is the first record I think that we're about to do that we're leaving to go and do on Tuesday. It's probably the first record that I'm really excited to do in like a decade or more. 
You know, like I've been, my thing is that I go through this personal horse shit right before we're going to do a record. And that's been documented too, where Clint or somebody will be like, you know, it never fails, man. We get ready to do a record and Morgan's got some sort of fucking thing going on, whether it's a divorce or, you know, something, something that's going to send me off the rails. And this is like the first record that we're doing in forever that I feel good. You know, that I don't have any, like, personal issues to deal with. I mean, I'm psycho as fuck, so obviously there's going to be some issue there, but I don't have anything new. Do you think (laughs) you, as a band, not just you, but everybody, did you all encounter burnout and just keep working? Oh, God, yeah. Oh, yeah, 100%. Because it's your job. I mean, I don't know. I'm not... Yeah, I'm not, like, extra, like, I try to not stir the fucking pot too much or or make, you know, I've kind of removed myself from a lot of interviews and stuff because I will speak too much of the truth. But here's the reality of it, and I'll probably get all the shit for this when it goes somewhere, but the fact is, is that anybody that wants to tell you that they were enjoying what was going on is a fucking liar. I mean, it was... It was real easy. Here's the deal. What do you want to do? You can't pay your fucking mortgage. I don't know. I guess I'm going to go and do what I do. That's a whole different thing than we've got this production ready for this really cool tour that we're going to do. I mean, we were doing tours for a while where, I mean, we were going through and playing the same fucking places over and over and over because they would pay us the most money. And it was like, you know, that's crazy you know i mean let's be honest when the lights go off and you get on the stage and you play the show and those people are there that feels good there was nothing about that that was that was that was like pulling teeth it wasn't like that it wasn't like i don't want to play concerts i don't want to do that anymore or i've You know, I mean, anybody that's in the business will tell you that if you've done 10 shows in 11 days, you don't want to play the next day. Your body's just beat up. But I mean, with, you know, relatively speaking, it was fine to play concerts for the people that were supporting us. And I remember looking at people that had been to every show that we had played in that town. And I remember turning around and looking at somebody, it might have been Clint, and saying, I feel so fucking bad for them because they love us so much that they're just not going to not show up. They're just going to be here. And they look like they're exhausted. They look like they're so tired of fucking hearing this same set and the same songs. They look they look like, oh man, will you guys just go fucking home for a minute already? You know, so that we can go on with our lives. I mean, that's what it felt like to me. And I had people that I was close enough with that told me they were like, man, you guys need a break. And we're like, dude, we've just gotten robbed again. We have no money. We're fucking broke. Like we we literally thought that we're making this giant chunk of money one day. And then three days later, we find out, no, you're not making any money. And you owe over a hundred grand each. Oh my God. You know, and it's like, wait a minute. And that happened more than once. So, you know, people like to keep perception all dialed in like, you know, it's all fucking good and i have like very few gripes left in my bag you know i've i've busted my ass at music for a long time i've sacrificed more than i ever wanted to sacrifice when it comes to my children and not seeing them and the the big thing is is that a lot of times we made bad decisions we trusted the wrong people and then we got burned and that kept us away from our kids more so it wasn't the fact that the burnout from being, from having to play, it was the burnout of like, I'm losing my fucking marriage here. Like I lo- I'm, I've lost my marriage because I can't work on it while I'm out here. You know, my kid is like starting to rebel and I can't do shit about it. Or, you know, I mean, all kinds of shit was going on. There's shit going on left and right. It was so fucking brutal. And all I could think was, you know, 
Don't you dare say anything about it because God forbid you tell anybody that you're a fucking normal human being. You know, especially in this beautiful world of social media where the fucking keyboard warrior comes out and says, I'd trade lives with you any day. And I'm like, oh, yeah. yeah go ahead. Fucking do it. You know I not mean, what you say. Yeah, go ahead, asshole. Because I'm. It's like, you know, the hour and a half, like I said, I'm blessed, man. I'm so lucky to be able to be going to Orlando in three days to record another record, getting paid to play music, finally finding a home with Rise that is like a place where, you know, we were treated better than we deserve, probably. And with a manager who cares about the well-being of us as human beings with you know i mean it's just a weird thing it's like damn man i mean i gotta admit i've i've very much in my life been a guy that unfortunately has looked at the glass half empty because it's just been more than half empty on many occasions but it's nice to look at it and see it like damn man this is a good position you know like we're in a really good spot I wish I wasn't fucking 95 years old. You right. know, I mean, I found something else to bitch about. You know, it's like, it's all great, but I wish I wasn't old. <laughs> hey, hey, Morgan, do you have, um, when you guys are going to Tampa, do you have pre-production? Do you guys still work with Corey Lowry at all? No, we did, uh, we did some stuff with him on the last record, but Corey's extra busy, you know? Corey's now in Cedar and all that, so... Yeah, Corey was used on a bunch of stuff. We'd always have Corey here in Atlanta, so I would usually... I mean, our pre-pro writing sessions usually go like LaShawn and John come to Atlanta, and, you know, we sit in a room with Vinny, and we, you know, John had some riffs, and we put together a few songs. And then in this, like me and LaShawn had gone to St. Louis and sat with Clint, and we put together, you know, Clint had some songs, and we kind of screwed around with those songs. And so on this record, me and LeJean and John went to Illinois and worked on like four or five ideas up there. And now me and Clint are gonna go Tuesday and we're gonna have like four days for me and him to work together and, and work up you know, some stuff that he's got brewing. And then uh, the other guys will get there and we'll put together what we got. It's awesome, man. And hopefully it sounds better than shit. <laughs> <laughs> sounds better than mud recorded. Do you like recording in Tampa? Well, yeah, well, in Orlando is where we're going. Orlando, but, I'm yeah, sorry. I, I, I really like it down there. I mean, you know, last record, I'm going through a fucking breakup, train wreck. You know, just about every night I'm lit. And uh, <laughs> so, you know, the funny, well, not funny, but the weird thing is, is that I did the right thing and I finally just didn't go and get myself into another relationship right away because I really was kind of going almost seamless, you know, girl to girl for the last like 20 years. So it's like that happened actually like right before that happened in like March. And then I think that we were in there to record the record in, I want to say September or October. So I've been single still, you know, through that whole thing. So maybe that's the problem is that, you know, I'm a shitty fucking boyfriend. <laughs> maybe, I just, maybe I just need to be on my own, you know, because now I'm just like, this is, this is great. You know, I mean, now I can go in there and I can focus on my work. My daughter is in college and ruling the earth and. I don't have to fucking, you know, she, other than worrying about your child like you would any other day, no matter how old they are, it's not that. My son is the easiest, um, you know, his situation is, is great, so I can focus on the work and get back here often. It's close enough where I can get home, and Elvis is absolutely awesome to work with, and his house is like a fucking castle, and uh, that's where we live. So, you know, I mean, what's not to love? I'll be with my dudes and I will uh, go ahead and live in a castle for two months. And you'll have the game on yeah. in the studio the whole time. Yeah, right. <laughs> Elvis is like, Elvis is like fucking Howard Hughes, man. I mean, it's so funny because there's me who is like, you know, let's document this shit. 
You know, let's document everything. Let's get cameras everywhere. You know, I want them to see all the idiotic shit. And then there's like, Lejean is like, no way, dude. And then there's Vinny, who is like, no way. And Clint, who probably would be like, you know, if you want to document, it has to be the right guy. Like, we've had some really good people that have done that kind of stuff for us. But now it's gotten to the point where it's funny all the guys that are like responsible and have wives and all that shit like they're they're totally cool with like let's just get the work done and do this responsibly and i'm like let's fucking have a fucking party bus or something you know and bring cameras in there to film it. let's have a fucking like, kegger Jesus yeah Christ, dude. yeah you know they're looking at me like dude fucking 80 years old go to bed <laughs> oh man Whew. What fucking album are we on? Uh, let's see. I think we got to Cold Day Memory, okay. and then we went yeah, all the way yeah. to All I See Is War. Okay. Yeah. That's my favorite. Well, that's the most. I say that's my favorite one. It's the last one to listen to. Uh, I listened to it today while I was working. <laughs> Much to the co- okay. So this is funny. Okay. So I'm I'm listening to the last two records while I'm at work today, installing a garage door, and the customer comes out after like three or four tracks and he's like hey buddy um we don't we don't really have like screaming metal in in, in our in our home and i was like oh well you know it's not the home you know you don't live in the garage and uh, right he made me turn it off he made me turn it off i was like damn like i and i can't be a dick you know because i gotta get paid right so don't you feel like a bitch oh i felt like a bitch yes (laughs) a hundred percent yeah (laughs) <laughs> and like, uh, oh, it. it was just so funny. But like that record was, I mean, it like is it generic to say that like, oh my god, this just breathes new life into the whole thing? There definitely are moments on there, you know. I mean, I do believe that this is going to be a different record. Um, I think that just the way that everything is, I think that the label has kind of opened up and said, listen we'd like you guys to be who you are at moments at least you know like there's this three-headed thing that was the thing that kind of got us it didn't get us noticed i mean i'm sure lejean's voice is the thing that got us noticed but um it's definitely a thing for us that helps keep us a little bit different you know the three different voices thing and uh so i think we're gonna really focus on that I know at least some of the songs that me and Clint are going to work on are going to be driven around that. And that's kind of bringing it back to animosity a little bit. Um, Maybe a little bit more straightforward. You know, I mean, Clint is... Clint can get extremely frustrated and bored in, uh, you know, in fucking caveman metal. Uh, (laughs) And that's like where we start to kind of I hate to use the the term prog out a little bit, you know, but get a little bit more challenging to ourselves. You know, I think we might focus a little bit more on not caring that much about whether anybody thinks that, you know, we're talented enough. I think that we've done what we're going to do. I think that the idea is to build a vibe on this record, kind of cinematic and uh, big and uh, not pay attention to the rules too much. I mean, again, this is really more of just me and Clint talking lately um, on the stuff that me and him are going to screw around with in the next few days. But I think that's really the idea, you know, to... It's hard to, you know, I don't think we're ever going to, like, sit here and be, you know, idiots and say we're going to try to completely reinvent ourselves after... 20 years and you know 12 or 13 records however many it is but but that record was like i mean kill the flaw was probably the one that we challenged ourselves the most on that one to this day i listen to it and i just laugh at some of the drum parts i'm like that ain't me dude i mean that's me but i don't play i don't do that that's me trying to be in the game with all these kids that are beating the shit out of me every day on the internet you know like i'm just I can't do it. Like, I'm not that kind of guy. That's, John Bonham wouldn't play that shit, and by all means, I am not putting myself in his fucking category at all, but as just as a point, he wouldn't play that shit, and probably couldn't, and probably wouldn't want to, you know? But somehow or another, I felt like I needed to 
try to challenge myself in there to say, you know, I can do that right there. You know, I can play that too, guys. You know, and it's like, come on, dude. Your grandpa. Just fucking do your shit and go home. <laughs> I don't know, man. I don't know many drummers that keep the show going the way that you do live. I hesitate to say one name because I know you've had multiple drum techs through the years, but if something goes wrong, you don't stop playing. And short story, I'm blind as fuck. When you're standing up trying to fix a pack on your back to get the headset running correctly and I hear the cymbals moving, I start looking for hands underneath you and I realize that you transition songs differently than probably anybody I've ever seen. Because if you're not playing, your tech's playing. And that doesn't include oh, yeah, the sure. triggers that you've used for effects over the years. Just like I want an 808 for this part of the song, so I'm just going to trigger something. You're the only yeah. person that does that. Well, there's some dudes out there that are taking everything to another level these days. But like I said, I mean, I'm just like, I think I've come at peace with everything at this point. I think at this point, I'm like, you know what? I know my shortcomings and every, I accept them in most every aspect of my life. You know, I, I've definitely been the player in, in a lot of my relationship issues. You know, I like to say, can you believe she did that to me? I used to say that all the time. And then I'm like, you know, I obviously played all into that. I had a major play in all of it. Um, you know, when it comes to success of the band and whether it should have been more or it should have been less or I looked at it now and I'm like you know we, we used to say can you believe that fucking guy robbed us can you believe they did that again and yeah it's like a lot of victim talk you know that I was just like damn man it's really exhausting when it's like no you just allowed them to sit there and do this when you knew something was weird so that's on you so just eat it move forward and go with it and when it comes to drums you know i'm more of a songwriter guy now i'm more of a guy that uh you know that cares more about what's going on. i mean even in the writing aspect of it like i want to be involved i want to create that that gets me off i'm excited to play drums on the record but it's been a long time since i've been excited about that i mean i usually don't like to play the drums i never practice I got 500 drum sets. They're not one of them set up. Um, we don't even rehearse for shows anymore. I mean, we when we go to Europe, we're not even rehearsing. I will have not played that set in months. And then we'll go and we'll just do a sound check and say, yeah, that's good, right? And just, you know, go. I mean, it's I've just accepted it. You know, I've accepted where I'm at. I'm happy with where I'm at. Uh, I wish I could have done some things differently, no question, but I'm, like, at peace. I'm good. Yeah, there's a certain sense of, like, we've been doing this shit forever. And, uh... Yeah. You know, you don't... You don't you're not... You're not out there trying to prove to somebody that, like, oh, my God, I'm just fucking above and beyond what everybody else is out there. The, the people the people that are on board are on board, you know, regardless of how yeah, proggy the record is it. or whatever. Yeah, I mean, like, I'm uncomfortable with any kind of accolades or any attention like that anyway i mean as far i appreciate it no question you know that i appreciate it but in my mind i know what the real deal is you know in my mind i'm like there's guys that live this shit and and all they care about is drums like all they want to do is and i commend them and respect them and envy their drive to be so like tunnel vision into nailing that like that that determination is is extremely like impressive to me i'm just not there i've got way too many other things that i want to do that i can't put my hand in that basket and i look at it almost like you know what i've done it long enough to where i think i'm good at what i do and i'm comfortable right there not to say i won't push you know push it when i get in the studio and try to get a little extra inspiration into some of the parts but i'm going to be thinking about writing a song i'm going to be thinking about counter melodies i'm going to be thinking about you know lyrics i'm going to be thinking about you know tagging different parts i'm going to be thinking about this other band that you know i'm a and r -ing at a record company that i work for i'm going to start thinking about this video that i have to do for this next single that these guys that i produced 
you know, are doing. I've got shit all over the place. So it's like, and through all that, I got to start, you know, make sure that number one on my list is making sure my kids are cool. So there's just really not that much time left to practice. The so, man doesn't yeah. practice <laughs> and you're, oh man, dude, you're the man in my eyes. That's all I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> so Seriously, dude, I'm this guy. I'm basically still out and I go, I got to tell you, man, basically I'm a fucking useless piece of shit. And you go. I love you, man. <laughs> I played <laughs> shows for years wearing a shirt that said, I wish I was Morgan Rose. God yeah, almighty, I mean, I've been I listening to this years. motherfucker. <laughs> I've been listening to this motherfucker for like 10 years. Be like, dude, you don't get it. Because like, I'm a, I'm like a brutal metal guy. Like I'm, I'm, you know, super, super double bass, crazy polyrhythmic bullshit, you know, guy. And Joe the whole time was like, dude, it's all about the feel. Okay, you need to right. listen to you need to listen to more Seven Dust, and I'm like, dude, I listen, I fucking listen to all of it for you, you know, <laughs> and uh, right, and and and, but I, I th- there is a little bit of clarity in what he's saying though, because I, I kind of think that in a sense the 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 locking in the knowing who you are aspect of it makes it more humid, you know, like it's more human overall. And is a little sure. bit more legitimate of a performance in the sense that you're getting who somebody is through their instrument. Whereas we live in a world now where it's just like you can fuck it and fix it, so to speak. You know, like you can just throw down whatever bullshit you want and we can just fix it on our MacBooks, you know, like and um, yeah. but so so like the the I I think what Joe's getting at, he's just fanboying out a little too much to to articulate it. But uh, I think I think what he's getting at is is just that the the idea of feel drumming. He's always been obsessed with it, and I and I totally understand it. In that, like, when you're just going with the way something feels, it adds a much more human element to the sound overall. And you can definitely hear that, you know, especially with what you provided us with as far as your mindset behind recording a lot of the albums has just been like, this is whenever I was all in, and this is when I wasn't. And you can hear that. Yeah, I mean, it, without question, it's uh, you know, it's. I think that even the ones that I was mentally busted up, you know, you can kind of hear like it's not that it's good or bad. There's an emotion in there. You know, there's something emotional going on in all those records, whether it be uh oh, guy's not doing too good, or whether it's he sounds really pissed or you know it's there I mean that part of it I feel does get through but you know I tr- I, and I try not to uh, depend too much on help you know I know that to me as a producer and as a guy that's in that world now uh, you know it's more like the performance has to be good it doesn't really matter. There's ways to fix things, obviously, but the performance has to be good. And I can't remember who it was that taught me that. I obviously was one of the guys that worked with us. Um, I really don't remember. I think it might have been Bush, you know, but somewhere along the lines, I accepted that. And I thought that is that is a fact. Imperfections are fine. Some of them can be kept. Uh, and the ones that can't be... Um, you know that's okay. Well, we can we can do we can fix that up enough to where as long as the performance is what it needs to be, then we're cool. <laughs> Joe's pointing a note at Scott. I think Scott's trying to say Scott's stuff, muted. He's I can't hear him. He muted himself, and so he starts talking, and then nobody oh. hears anything. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love modern technology. <laughs> there we go. Come on, Scott. He's still trying to talk. He can't. We can't hear. Can't hear you, we Scott. Can't hear You're you, muted, dude. man. He's about to say something brilliant. We're going to oh, miss I it. Oh, I dropped off. Let me add him back in. We're going to miss it. <laughs> <laughs> the poor oh, guy's just trying it. to go to a Fozzie concert. We're like, no, motherfucker. We're doing the whole history of Can Seven Dust right now. You yeah. guys realize Dude, Chris Jericho is at this I'm show, right? I'm the absolute worst with these. I will fucking sidestep that shit and go right into something that is like, before you know it, it's all about, you know completely different subject i mean i don't even know if we talked about any of the records <laughs> allow me to sidestep for a moment dude we made it through we, we made how it to the finish line did you end up playing drums on ghost embrace 
that was my old manager um, asked me if I'd be interested in playing on somebody's record and I didn't even know any of the music I didn't even know anything and I was like what do you think and he goes well I think that you're off for this much time you're gonna have a big chunk of time off it'll be a nice trip you know you can get some drumming in and uh, you know I'm always a fan of being in the studio to be honest with you uh, especially if it's not my shit like <laughs> I love it in there there's something way more uh, stress filled with doing a seven dust record um, I mean I think that I've written most of my best shit for other people because it's just like you know they can either say I like it or I don't like it and at the end of it there's no feelings involved you know and no extra stress that comes with being in seven dust um so yeah i was like cool so i can go in and i'll do like 10 songs and uh that that'll be great you know i'll do 10 songs and i didn't even know what i was doing and it turned into like you know a vacation i went out there i played some drums and shot some guns watched you know all kinds of crazy shit going on with you know a bunch of dogs that i love animals and I met some really cool people, and yeah, it was cool. You were the second drummer to play for that particular project. The first was Chad Kent, who is one of my favorites also, so obviously I'm a fanboy about that particular thing, even though Dan thinks I'm insane for anything Ghost Embrace. <laughs> it's, you know, it's well, fine, it's dude. Definitely not, it's definitely not this style by any means. I mean, it's far from, from this. Uh... You know, I didn't even, I, I'm not even sure I knew any vocals or anything. It was like the music was kind of done. And then I just kind of went in there and said, you know, what do you want me to, what, do you, what kind of thing do you want? I was surprised, to be honest, because when I went in, uh, I kind of went in there. I, I don't like to say it was not prepared. I just wanted to go in there clean. I didn't want to go in there with any any real notion of I, I asked what the music was like and I was told that it was rock and when I went in I was like I don't know what this is really I don't I, there was no vocals on it that I had really heard I'd heard some demos that had some vocals but uh, some of it I heard nothing so I was like this just sounds like I can jam on it you know this, this should be pretty simple I yeah I'm not sure if you guys can hear me now but that that's great <laughs> we can hear you man Oh, good. Scott's nice. back. I made several comments. And I was like, ah, just Morgan doesn't care what I'm saying right now, but nobody can hear what I'm saying. We're just we're <laughs> just ignoring you. We put you on block. Hey, that's cool, man. <laughs> oh, dude, I love you guys. Thank you. <laughs> guys, I think we made oh, it to man. the end. I don't know. Uh... We made it to the finish line. I'm I'm so happy. Well, Morgan, let me ask you before we uh, before we lose you for the rest of my life. Because I'm dead now. Your life, <laughs> Jesus! That's ins- that's crazy. Uh, one of the things we do every week is uh, we all pick an album of the week, something you're listening to for the past seven days. It doesn't have to be metal; it can be whatever you want. Morgan Rose, what is your album of the week? Oh my god, it's gonna be weird, but it's uh, Alessandro Cortini. That's what I've been listening to pretty much for the last like five days because uh there's that and then there's um this han zimmerman who is like more of uh orchestral music and yeah. it's really i've been listening to that stuff the alessandro is uh nine inch nails is a uh, keyboard player so he does all like the program or he's the programmer keyboard player so i've been just listening to different things trying to get like melodic inspiration to do something you know a little different because we're getting ready to go in do you mainly listen to metal when you're going into the studio or do you listen to the exact opposite yeah i don't listen to metal that much i mean i listen to older metal stuff than i do like i love the new corn record i do love that um i do love the fever 333 record there's a bunch of stuff that i like but when i'm just like listening uh bless you so like this is the last let me go look at my thing this is the last few things that i've been listening to is being as an ocean uh uh the cure uh katie perry there you go 
<laughs> Boston. Same. Uh, Rough Cut, which is some 80s stuff. Judas Priest, The Scorpions, Dokken. I went on an 80s kick there for a little bit. Hell Eli yeah. Goulding, Cold. Uh, I really like the Cold. I love Cold, man. I've been listening yeah, to New Records. Love, love them. Uh, Attila. That's like some of the heavy. Attila is one of the heavier things I've been listening to a lot. They're so much fun. Yeah, yeah that's just straight beat the shit out of somebody <laughs> music. Yep. So, yeah, I don't ever listen to, I don't usually listen to heavy stuff. The funny thing is, though, is that I'll listen to some heavy stuff and then I'll tell Clint to go and listen to a few of these songs to, like, inspire him into getting heavier. And then he'll come in and take that shit into a whole nother place and I'll be like, oh, Jesus, I just created a fucking monster. Like, I think that I was playing, like, North Lane or something for him before we did, uh, the Kill the Flaw record, he came in and the shit was so technical and crazy. I was like, oh man, I don't know how to play any of this. <laughs> so, I was like, why did I let him hear that band? You know, like, it was crazy. So, dude, um, I just want to say that I love Morgan. And <laughs> we just paid for parking, and the, and the guy goes, We gave him money. He goes, Hey, that guy wasn't legit. You just gave him a bum money. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm doing. Okay. I'm sorry, y'all. You're good, Scott. <laughs> but no, man, this has been great, man. And I appreciate you guys like letting me be on board on this podcast. And oh, totally. Here, That's amazing. Totally, man. Yeah, thank you. Thank you guys for letting me, you know. I felt like I just got a, uh, here, let me even see. What is that? That's a full-on two-hour therapy session. Hell yeah, dude. That'll be we're, $5. We're here for you, you know. <laughs> Dude, Morgan is the best, man. I, I wish all my interviews were like that, man. It's amazing. Yeah. No, it's... <laughs> Dude, you mentioned St. Louis and Illinois a couple times. You need to let us know when you're in the neighborhood. That's when all you're I in the neighborhood, say. man, we'll come out. We'll have some drinks with you. It'd be awesome. What is the fast food roast beef place there that they don't have anywhere else but there that's the best ever? I have to my Lion's it Choice? Now. Oh, my God, dude. I'm going. Yeah, yeah Lion's, Lion's Choice. <laughs> yeah. Lion's Choice is the shit. I actually went into a place, I think it's called JP's over there, and I won forty fucking thousand dollars on Kino one night. <laughs> you fuck. <Dude. laughs> That's insane. Yeah. Best ever. So when Seven Dust rolls into town, we need to go to Lion's Choice. Got it. I'll write that down. <laughs> Lion's Choice, dude. Lion's Choice is like the best fast food place on earth. Oh hell yeah, dude. They do they do fast food, ice cream, anything you want. Yeah, dude. We'll uh, we'll hang out for sure. I'll probably be in St. Louis anyway, you know, at some point. I'm a I'm a crazy person, so St. Louis and like I said, Clint is there, so Yeah, absolutely. I'm sure I'll be in St. Louis. We'll we'll go and uh we'll hit up the loop and we'll hit up uh the uh whatever the casino Maristar over there. Oh yeah there. dude. I've lost so much money there. <laughs> Le, Le, what is it? Lemire? Lanier, Lemire's? Is that the other there's one? There's Lumiere. There's Lumiere. There's uh, um, Ameristar. And then uh, if you want to go down to Hickville, we have River City also. Hell yeah. Yeah. yeah I'll I've, gamble, but yeah. Scott's paying. I've lo- Yeah, Scott's uh, definitely paying. He's driving up that? here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, right. Yeah. No shit. All right. Yeah, that sounds perfect. Well, right, Morgan, guys. thank you hey, so Scott. much, man, for taking the time out to talk hey, to us tonight. Absolutely, man. Thank Dude, you guys. Lord, I love <laughs> oh, man. All right. Well, listen, you guys have a great night. Scotty, call me tomorrow. All right. All right, brother. Talk, talk to, to you, you guys later. later. Let me know if you want to go. I love you, man. Thank you. If you want to go. So I got to ask, man, how how was the Fozzie concert? Dude, the show was awesome. Um, when we were doing the podcast, actually, we were trying to park and the guy said $20. So I'm talking to you guys and I hand Andrew, uh, my friend, 20 bucks. Andrew gives him money. We're waiting. It's taking like maybe 10 minutes. And um, finally, this other guy comes over and goes, $20. Well, we just paid the other guy $20. And the guy goes around and goes, uh, I think you just paid a bum $20. <laughs> so oh, shit. I just paid $40. All this is going on during the podcast, so it's kind of funny. But uh, yeah, the Fozzie show was awesome. They, the set list was killer. Um, man, they packed that place out. I think they sold it out. Did anybody make the list? <laughs> I, 
I probably made the list. I don't know. <laughs> I was trying to make the list. I was trying to make the back, uh, the backstage list. <laughs> but no, dude, it was a blast, man. We had, we had a blast. It was so fun. Jericho has the list. I actually am not a huge wrestling fan, and I only know Jericho from the music. That's yeah. awesome. That's awesome. I believe that's a rarity because most yeah, people know, know him for either his time in Japan or his time in WCW. I actually got to interview him once, and I told him that. I was like, dude, I'm just a music fan, and I love Fozzie. And it's, he seemed like kind of refreshed. He's like, oh, well, that's great. Talk about Fozzie. No, oh, that's, that's really cool. Yeah, because nobody, you, you know nobody uh, probably ever says that to him. You know, like, mm-hmm. hey, man, I just I just really like I just really like your music. But uh, no, that's really cool, man. I, uh, I I'm I need to get out to a show here soon because I haven't escaped the confines of my basement for a while, and I just need to get out of the house. Other yeah. than you know, other than work, so I'm just like super jealous. You're like, yeah, I'm going to a concert, but I'll I'll do this podcast with you, I guess. You know, as a favor to you, you know. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Dude. and then I was late. Did we mention that in the intro that I was late for the uh, <laughs> for the interview? <laughs> Scott's like, uh, Scott's like, hey, you, you, you guys are about to call, right? And I was like, yeah, I'm gonna call you in an hour. And uh, he's like, no, dude. And I was like, oh no, we, I did the time zone thing again. No, I haven't done that. I haven't done that in over a year. Like, messed up the time zones. Yeah, you said, uh, are you are you on Eastern? And I said, yep. Me and Morgan are on Eastern. <laughs> And that was fun, man. Like we're both sitting here just wondering what's going on. You see, if I had showed up on time, we might have gotten three hours out of Morgan instead of two. <laughs> That's true. And what a three hours that would have been. That would have been cool, man. This has definitely been one of one of my uh, one of the most fun episodes that we've done. And um, yeah, man, I, I I wouldn't trade it for the world. Like it was uh, it was so much information about Seven Dust stuff that I hadn't even thought about. Like like for instance. Now that, you know, if you're listening to this outro, you've already heard the interview, hopefully. Um, But, you know, like whenever I was driving, I was driving with a buddy of mine the other day. And I was like, hey, have you ever heard of Seven Dust? And he's like, dude, I mean, Seven Dust is a pretty big band, man. Like, yeah, of course I've heard of them. And uh, I was like, oh, okay, I was just checking. And he's like, he's like, yeah, they were like mainstream. Like, they're probably all rich or whatever. And I was like, well, you know, actually, um, it turns out that yeah, they definitely sold a ton of records, but uh, according to, according to their drummer, they they didn't make any money, and they were very upset about that at first. Yeah. At first, yeah. So that was uh, th- that was really mind blowing to me because I, I I considered Seven Dust to be such a big band that like they were like unobtainable, like as far as um, you know, like like that they because they they took so many great bands out on tour and stuff throughout their existence i just always assumed that they were like a mainstream like big level band but after doing this interview i realized that like that was just a perception and if they were really selling out selling that much that like they and they weren't making any money like they must have had the worst record deal ever (laughs) from anybody they're actually working on a brand new album uh i think this week or next week Dude, Morgan's the best, man. I, I I love it that he's so open during this interview. Yeah, he was great, man. I mean, I I, uh, I loved it. Like I just, uh, <laughs> I we, we you never get that kind of honesty out of anybody, and it's it's like really refreshing to hear somebody just tell you how it is. Oh, absolutely. And 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 you heard him say like during the interview, he goes, you know, I usually don't do podcasts or I don't do. Did he say podcasts or interviews? Because it seemed like he, he mentioned. Po- he said interviews. I think. Only Joe knows. Yeah. Joe's like edited the whole thing by now, but like <laughs> um, Joe was editing it in real time. You know, like he wanted to get this episode out. So uh, I, I hope uh, I hope everybody enjoyed this as much as we did, and uh, I can't wait to hear some of the comments that uh, that will get. You know, <laughs> just just from from getting that big dose of information. Final oh, yeah. thoughts on Seven Dust, Dan. Oh man, Seven Dust. I mean, what else is there to say? I mean, one of the most accomplished bands of the past 25, 30 years, in my opinion. Uh, They're a band that I feel like never really achieved the level of respect that they probably deserved. Um, They're responsible for taking so many bands out. 
breaking you know breaking new bands in and just being super hard workers and um like my own my own personal opinion is that you know i think sometimes especially with some of their later output can sometimes sound a little bit samey but at the same time like if you're a seven dust fan then that's what you want and that's what they give you every time so i mean who can you really like can you really complain about that if you're a fan i don't think you can scott bowling what about you dude dan said it all man that was good that's hard to follow up that uh, what I love about Seven Dust is that I'm from Atlanta. They're from Atlanta. When I was 17, one of the first shows I ever saw at the Masquerade downtown Atlanta was Seven Dust. I was blown away by it, and just the fact that like I'm I'm friends with them now. It's just it's amazing, and their fan base is huge. I mean, I've never seen anything like that. Facebook, they have a huge fan base, and always had a fan base even before Facebook. They've always had a following. Just this cult following and i love the fact that um they've been around so long now that they can go back and play these first albums from start to finish the second home and and hopefully the third my favorite animosity from start to finish and i feel, really feel like that that's how you made it when you can go back and play these albums and your fans just love it and you're just worshipped and it's worshipped by your fans so i i, I love seven dust and i always will and so thank you guys so much for letting me be part of this yeah man and and let's not understate it thank you for setting all this up everybody say thank you scott all at once (laughs) (laughs) thank you scott i said it at the start of the interview morgan is one of the holy trinity of drummers in my eyes i cannot believe that this podcast has allowed me to talk to now two of the three greatest drummers in my eyes who's the third one chad sexton oof Love that dude. He's That's the beast. awesome. It would be an understatement for me to say anything that isn't positive about Seven Dust. They are a band that I used as ammunition against Dan in his world of everything has to be extreme today. I know yesterday it was different. It was all about grunge, but today yeah. it's all about Zayo. Still is. <laughs> Seven Dust was a band that I always pulled out when everybody said thrash metal's a thing. It's got to be played this way. There isn't any hybrid band that really matters other than 311 or The Urge if you're in St. Louis. Love The Urge. And I said it during the podcast. I feel like Seven Dust is the heaviest hybrid music you can listen to. They're not just straight metal, but they appeal to a metal crowd. They're not just hard rock, but they appeal to the hard rock crowd. They can play an acoustic set and a heavy set in the same town and everybody's going to go to both shows so listen to seven dust because you're missing out if you're a fan of heavy music damn what's your album of the week my album of the week oh my goodness that one's going to be kind of hard to it's hard to pin down because i want to say that it's circle back but i think i retired it already didn't i I'll let you have it one more week if you want circle back terminus get it it's amazing you can get it on <laughs> vinyl now check it out and also go on Brutally Speaking and check out my interview with John Marino of Circleback. Trust me on this. It's good stuff. Scott Bowling, what about you? So actually, I'm trying to pronounce this right. I, I usually don't listen to country music, but there's a, new, a country guy I love that's been on Joe Rogan recently, uh, Sturgill Simpson. And he has an old school country uh but he just put out this rock record. It kind of sounds like The Wall, Pink Floyd, and it's just a trippy, like, it's not your typical country kind of artist. Sturgill Simpson. Not your grandma's country. <laughs> yes. <laughs> For me, it's Get Some by Snot. Yes. You don't talk to Morgan Rose for two hours and then not listen to Snot. I just assume that you're always listening to Snot. We're gonna take well, your town. On yeah, because I mean, hey, you know, I gotta, I gotta mention that that, that I was, uh, I was getting a little choked up during that conversation when you guys were talking about Lynn, because I was just like, man, we're getting all emotional here on discography discussion. Like, <laughs> we don't really do, we don't really do that too much. But he's, you know, just uh, it was just so sincere. It was a very sincere conversation. So I just, uh, I, I love that about it. Oh, that's, that's great, man. Have you ever been sitting there wondering, why do these guys keep talking about all these bands that are not my favorite bands? I want them to talk about my favorite band. 
Well, there's a variety of ways that you can let us know what your favorite band is. You see, we're not mind readers, so you, you kind of have to help us out a little bit. One way you can do that is you can reach out to us on Facebook under facebook.com slash discography discussion. You can tweet at us at Discuss Metal. Or if you want to tweet at me, me or Joe individually, you can tweet us at Discuss Metal Dan and Discuss Metal Joe. You could even send us an email at show at gmail.com. And we even have our own Discord server that is hopping right now. If you guys want to join the discussion on Discord, we have a link in the show notes that you can click on to take you to our Discord server. There is conversations happening on there 24 hours a day. I can't keep up with it. Joe can't keep up with it. It's madness. And we have so much fun talking to you guys on Discord. So definitely check us out there. If you can't get a hold of us any other way, I mean, it's your fault. I've given you like 12 different ways. I don't do math very good, so don't go back and check it. And on that note, this has been episode 137 of Discography Discussion. Thank you for listening. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Discuss Metal. Subscribe to our podcast everywhere you listen to podcasts, including Google Play, Apple Podcasts, and Stitcher. Visit DiscussMetal.com for all things discography discussion. And please send questions and comments to Dan and Joe Show at gmail.com. If you are not a patron, you can become one at patreon.com forward slash discuss metal. We have some sweet perks. Scott Bowling and Good Company can be found online, Facebook, YouTube, or scottgoodcompany.com. Warning may or may not contain actual bowling. Perfect. <laughs> it should. One of these days, one of these days it will be that. Like, you'll get like Brian Head Welch to come out and you guys will go bowling and. You'll call yeah, it good dude. company, good company with actual bowling. It'll be amazing. <laughs> Do a charity thing. That'd be amazing. Welcome to uh, bowling, cool. bowling. Twenty-four yeah. hours of bowling. I, I oh would, my gosh! I would drive down there for that. <laughs>